Eileen? At 9.30. Yes. Yeah. Sandra gave me the Good morning. Look. I'm good to go at 9.30. <laughs> Good morning. Wow, you're loud. It's clear. Okay, we have a new rule where we're going to... Board member. Right. Uh -huh. We're going to gavel at 9.30 and sharp. I Mertz has it in big letters on my my paperwork here. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And the time is now... Keep doing that. I've done it already. The time is now 9.31, and a quorum of the board is present. At our special meeting. I think, yeah. Yep. And I think I heard Eileen maybe on the phone? Yes. And the State Board of Education yep. meeting of April 8th, 2014 is called to order. As I said, the board's encouraged me to use the gavel, and I'm going to do that cautiously. Uh, first item is approval of agenda and order priority. Is there a motion, please? So moved. Second. By, by Dan, supported by Lupe. Any changes or additions, deletions? All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Thank you. Mertz, please. I'd like to introduce the people seated around the table to you. To my immediate left, as we go around the table, is Mike Flanagan. He's the State Superintendent of Public Instruction. He's Chairman of the Board. As we go around to his left, John Austin, President of the Board, and he's from Ann Arbor. The Vice President of the Board is Cassandra Albridge from Rochester Hills. The Board Secretary, Dan Varner from Detroit. Next to Dan Varner, Lupe Ramos-Montini from Grand Rapids, State Board of Education member. Next to Lupe is Gary Abood, Jr. He teaches in Gross Point North, part of the Gross Point Public Schools school system, and he's chemistry and science teacher. And across the table from him is Craig Ruff. Craig is unable to join us today. He's the Governor's Strategic <coughs> Education Advisor. Next to Craig Ruff would be Eileen Weiser. You do not see her, you hear her. She's on the telephone mm -hmm. joining us. <laughs> and Kathleen Strauss. She's from Detroit, board member. Next to her, Michelle Fecto. She is the board's NASB delegate. It's their association, National Association of State Boards of Education. And did I say you were from Detroit? If I, yeah. She is. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard Ziley is the board's treasurer from Dearborn. Thank you. Thanks, Mertz. I don't have a video to start today to set the tone, but I do have one quick pic picture. Not quite Gary. I don't quite have this showdown yet for how to use media appropriately. <laughs> now, you may think that's an undercover law enforcement person who has the state superintendent and ready to put him into a car. That actually is a program in Centerline Schools. And uh, they had some fun with that. Um, oh. You don't see the final conclusion where I'm actually in the back of the police car. but. I thought I'd call it to your attention because Centerline has, as many public schools do, that don't get enough credit for preparing kids with certificates who could, if they chose to, leave right out of high school, whether it's in, uh, they had an ambulance, uh, not an, a medical, um, an EM program, thank you. Um, and then with the law enforcement, there's some certificates available. Now, most of them go on to it to community college and further that, and some go on to four-year degrees. But very impressive visit, and if you go there, watch out for the police. <laughs> <laughs> um, all this March madness aside, by the way, I just can't let it go unnoticed. I get ribbed all the time for having gone to Notre Dame. But the Notre Dame women are undefeated, and they're playing the undefeated UConn team tonight. So I would recommend that if you like March Madness, you'd want to watch basketball tonight when two undefeated teams, not these kind of second-rate teams that played last night, <laughs> actually meet head-to-head. -head. Um, and then I do this. take a deep breath on this one. We'll have other opportunities, as you know. But this is Carol Wollenberg's last State Board of Ed meeting. And uh, she's just been... <laughs> <You> look so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen that. Well. <laughs> She's that wasn't a yeah. that wasn't applause because we're glad. That was applause oh, sure. because we're, we're happy. And you know, <laughs> for those who don't know, I mean, she's worked uh, here at the department for over 30 years. She's been deputy superintendent since 1995. Uh, she's just—I can't tell you um, what a great person she is to work with. 
Uh, her division is very complicated. It's everything from when you hear about these deficit tough decisions that are forced for the department to make. Even though technically I'm the one under the law that has to make them, I can't tell you how comforting it is to have Carol and her team have done all the proper work, all the work to try to get districts so that they're not in that kind of position. Um, and just, I can't say enough good things about her. Uh, in, in terms of the way she's thought of in the department, very highly regarded. And uh, we're certainly going to miss her. I'm going to miss her personally and professionally. And uh, we're, we're having a celebration for her here on April 22nd, which you'll get an invitation for. And uh, we'd love to have you attend. We'll get information out if it hasn't been already. So, ladies and gentlemen, just one more time, if you would give our recognition. <laughs> <laughs> this actually was to Carol's got a part on the agenda today and I know her well enough that <clears throat> we'd want to get that started and out of the way a little bit now so that she's able to and please don't make me cry during that <laughs> <laughs> okay and there's a, a con a resolution in the consent agenda today that you'll see and it really we thought this was thoughtfully done it wasn't just one of these let's put some words together it was a, a kind of a group effort to be specific about the kind of contributions that Carol's made to the department so the board will have a chance to recognize her officially at that time okay the uh, first item today this is just uh, I think John and the board have done a great job in really pulling together this kind of dialogue on school organization and finance and uh, for those who don't know or relatively new to this or watching the, the scores of millions that are watching on the internet right now um, this has really been important for us and I think good for the state um, you know I find myself and I've got to work I'm, this is talking to myself right now which I do often that it's sometimes difficult to listen to someone share a perspective that's different from mine so I'm I almost have to work at listening to it and then try to think about is that am I prejudging it am I um, defending my thinking before I've even heard the other points of view so what this has been helpful for me to do is to hear other perspectives and think that makes a good point or reinforces some of the points you already think about um, and so I'm going to turn it over to President uh, John Austin who's going to make introductions and has arranged for this thank you and we are continuing to hear from sort of diverse points of view from education policy and expert community as Mike indicated about the, the nature of the challenges facing our schools and our school finance system and ideas for the direction <coughs> of changes that we need to make as a state uh, after today I think we're going to turn to uh, have stakeholders the many education constituencies who have perspective to come share publicly their thoughts and recommendations as well but we're we're happy to have today uh, two groups, uh, as Mike indicated, with uh, perhaps different perspectives, but important that we get their thoughtful analysis. And, and first, Audrey Spalding. Audrey, would you join us at the table, please? Audrey Spalding is the Director of Education Policy at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Uh, she oversees the Center's Education Research and Publications, including the Michigan Education Digest and the Michigan Education Report. Uh, she's been at the center since 2012. Prior to that, she worked at the St. Louis-based Show Me Institute, where she did similar analytic research and provided legislative uh, input on a variety of education-related issues. She's also been a reporter. So both of our presenters today have former lives as reporters with the Columbia Missourian. Audrey, thanks for joining us. And uh, as you know, we're going to split the next couple hours uh, between uh, you all and the uh, Ed Trust group and. I know you uh, we always have lots of questions from the board, but we won't have to keep you uh, keep you on pace because it sounds like you're you're happy to try to share for 20 minutes your perspective and then uh, have some discussion. And thanks again for coming. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm I'm honored to address the board and to provide, as you put it, a diverse perspective. And I, I do feel that um, in education policy, there's room for intellectual 
differences and debates, but I think that we probably all can find some common ground. So um, today, I actually wanted to start with a quote from a 1996 study commissioned by the Michigan Department of Education. And I, I begin with this quote just to show the gravity of what you are examining today. And I, I think that this quote still, still is true, and I'll read it. The, the educational system established a century ago still exists, but it is now larger and less than ever responsive to the needs of parents and children. And I, I hope by looking at this, we can understand just how much attention needs to be drawn to addressing Michigan's school finance system. What I hope to accomplish today, speaking before you, is to spend some time on the issue of the trajectory of per pupil spending in the state, uh, and discuss the question of whether spending is related to outcomes in the state, and then discuss whether there are ways of improving our educational system with minimal cost. The, this chart before you shows inflation adjusted per pupil spending in Michigan going back all the way to 1944. And um, can you all hear me? Is this? Okay. Uh, and this data comes first from the MDE 1996 study and then is uh, completed with data from the National Center for Education Statistics. So you can see that over time the general trend is up. There have been a few peaks and valleys, mm -hmm. but overall school spending consistently <coughs> is increasing, even adjusted for inflation. Another way of looking at school spending in the state is to look at the state funding of the school aid budget and to compare that to enrollment. This is a shorter time period from 2000 to 2014 and shows that uh, school funding has increased by 7.4% between fiscal year 2011 and 2014 and during the meantime enrollment was down 2.4%. Another way of questioning school spending is to look at the investment from taxpayers. Uh, the U.S. Census Bureau, through the uh, Department of Commerce, came out with a report um, a year ago showing school revenue per $1,000 of per capita income. Uh, on this measure, Michigan ranks ninth nationally, uh, compared to Massachusetts coming at, at 34th and Florida at 50th. So there's been some discussion of our, uh, our relative uh, investment in the school system. But when we're looking at it from the basis of uh, taxpayer ability to pay, Michigan actually ranks fairly highly according to this information. So moving on to the question of whether more money might be able to improve outcomes, which I think is the key question, especially when considering the financial hardship that some districts are facing. This uh, chart comes from the Cato Institute. Andrew Colson did great work. He published two studies in March of this year. One that did the uh, layman's work to adjust SAT raw data for participation rates as well as population to create a long-term trend line. One of the issues is with uh, NAEP data, we can only go back so far on the state level. So by Colson's work, this allows us to go back to 1972. And he compared that to, again, school spending. And so for Michigan, which is similar to other states that he examined, spending has increased over time, but the end result appears to have remained relatively the same. He also notes that of the other states that he looked at, some which did see real declines in per pupil inflation-adjusted spending did not see a, a, a resulting downtick in student academic uh, achievement. So this, this uh, underlines perhaps the disconnect that might exist between spending and outcomes. This slide, it comes from a Harvard University study. Um, each of the dots that you see represents a different state. On the x-axis is the increase in per pupil expenditures from 1990 to 2009. So we're looking at a shorter time horizon here. And on the y-axis is the annual test score gains between 1992 and 2011. And this is, this is NAEP data. So you can see that Michigan is in the lower left-hand quadrant just below Arizona. Uh, we have relatively low annual increases in student academic outcomes. Florida is in uh, the top left-hand side, indicating that it has had a relatively low increase in expenditure, but a tremendous increase in student academic achievement. Um, Massachusetts is over to the right, 
uh, as I'm sure you uh, will hear later today, Massachusetts has seen uh, increases in annual uh, student growth, but has also increased its expenditure significantly. So the takeaway that the authors note from this particular chart is that nationwide, they were not seeing a relationship between expenditure <coughs> of pupil and student outcomes alone. Meaning um, what you'll probably take to be a theme from my presentation, that it's not how much you spend, but it's how you spend it. What, uh, what did the line represent? The line would be, if there were a trend, what that trend would be. Um, I think, I don't believe that they found a significant trend. It's just that that was the overall pattern. The, the 1996 uh, study commissioned by MDE took quite a detailed look at individual district spending as well as outcomes. And it concluded in part that expenditures per pupil have a quote, indeterminate effect. Uh, it also suggested in one portion that the evidence might even indicate at the time possible overspending in the public school system. And I realize that this is an older study, but I, I encourage you to look to it as a resource only because it was such a wealth of information in terms of spending and outcomes. And again, it was related to the question that you all are broaching today. So a different way to look at this question is instead of looking at it over time, to ask whether there's a pattern between how much schools spend today and what, where they are ranked by the state's top to bottom ranking. And I use that measure because it's a measure that the department stands by to measure school academic performance. So here is just a simple scatter plot. It's, not, um, it's nothing more than correlation, but I do think it's interesting. Uh, for 2011-2012, total building level expenditure, so each of those dots is a school, represented by building level CEPI data, did not appear to have a pattern with the way that the state ranks schools, this top to bottom ranking. I restricted it further by just looking at the amount that was reported by these schools as being spent on professional educational salaries, with the argument being that if something had an, a relationship with student performance, you would think it would be teacher pay because teachers can have a tremendous impact <laughs> on student outcomes. And again, there was no discernible relationship. Another interesting question that was posed at the last board meeting was whether t uh, beating the odds schools do things differently, whether they might have a pattern of spending that could give the department guidance moving forward. And at least uh, in this simple scatter plot, they appear to follow roughly the same pattern. This is, um, this is cursory analysis further into the question of whether beating the odds schools spend money differently. So um, what I did is I looked at the average total cost reported for beating the odds schools against the average total cost reported for priority schools, and then just a few basic uh, categories to see if there was something different about those schools. And I, I present this to you not as conclusive information, or a, a conclusion, but rather as one path that the department might want to consider moving forward uh, to understand where spending might have an impact, uh, and where spending might not have an impact. So just, just to underline this, uh, this statement comes from Alfred Lindseth, who has represented a number of states that have faced adequacy lawsuits. Uh, and he states, more money without fundamental changes in how it is spent will not improve student performance. And I, I include this visual. Uh, this visual is a photo from Henry Ford School in the Highland Park District. This is its swimming pool in the state that it was left when the conventional district left. And I include this, this is actually one of the um, least uh, appalling photos, honestly, of the facilities. But the reason I include it is because, it, to me, it's a visual reminder that when we talk about financial mismanagement, we're not just talking about, you know, you spent a dollar or two more, but that the, the financial mismanagement has real impact and could, in fact, and likely impact students in the classroom. That's where I went to middle school. Oh, is that? Henry Ford, Did that's you? where I went to middle school there. I, I've, I've only met one person who was there when um, the swimming pool was operational. Are you one of those people? Yes. 
Can you see your desk? Dr. Z. I was called other things in those days. So uh, the, the promise of choice, right? You know, one of the points I stated at the beginning of this was that perhaps is there a way for us to improve outcomes uh, with, little, with little cost? And I wanted to go over just the extent of choice in this state. Um, we have, a, in some respects, a pretty robust choice system. Almost 150,000 Michigan students attend charter schools. Almost another 100,000 use schools of choice. Almost 120,000, uh, 20, excuse me, attend a private school. So a good percentage of our population comes from families that are making a um, explicit decision of where their child goes to school. This information comes from recent Mackinac Center analysis of our school of choice system. And I think it's interesting because, you know, we hear a lot about charter schools, but we don't hear as much about school of choice. And what we did is we looked at every time a student left a district and moved to a district, different district, we treated that as a vote and asked what are the characteristics of the district that the child is leaving and what are the characteristics of the district that the child is entering? What is the, dis what is the difference? And on average, how does that bear out? And I, I, view the, I view these results positively. We found on average um, Michigan students using school of choice were entering districts with math scores eight percentage points higher, reading proficiency 8.9 percentage points higher, five percentage points higher graduation rates, 3% lower dropout rates, a slightly higher per pupil, uh, excuse me, pupil teacher ratio, um, slightly lower expenditures per pupil, and slightly higher mean teacher salary. So this is, this is pretty heartening. Um, and I will say that this is a replication of something that MSU did in 1999, and we saw similar outcomes. So it seems like uh, even though a number of things have changed since 1999, that perhaps this suggests that Michigan families when they make an educational choice, value roughly the same thing. Um, I wanted to, Marion Springs is not the only district that is uh, embracing choice in an innovative way, but I wanted to highlight them again as another case of how choice is being used by the conventional system to improve things. Uh, Marion Springs has seen enrollment up 45% since 2006. The district expanded its alternative education offerings for non-resident students. Uh, more than a quarter of its enrollment comes from school of choice. And it's done, it's done, a, num it's made, it's done a, num a number of innovative things and created innovative offerings. And so really this is a great example of a district that embraced school of choice as a positive factor. I, I just wanted to touch on briefly the Stanford University Credo study. I'm sure you are all familiar with it, but it is the most exhaustive examination of charter school performance in the state. Uh, matched uh, students to their virtual peers on a host of factors and found that those students were achieving greater levels of learning compared to their peers attending the district that they would otherwise have attended. And um, I say this, I, the reason I wanted to underline it is that sometimes uh, people like to call charter schools to the mat for their lower level of performance. But what's really critical is growth, right? Especially when you have <coughs> charter schools serving a higher percentage of students who come from uh, poverty backgrounds. Just a brief review of um, the literature on full choice. Um, 12 empirical studies using random assignment over more than a decade programs throughout the country. 11 out of 12 found that choice improves student academic outcomes in some respect. Uh, half, six of those studies found that all students benefited uh, academically. Five, five found that students had some benefit while others were unaffected. One found no impact. And so just the point being here again, um, that this is evidence that we should, we should trust parents with these decisions, or we should give more trust to parents for these decisions. So considering the information before you, both from myself, but also from others, because certainly I did not touch on the number of districts in deficit, <coughs> something that was addressed, I, I believe, very fully during your last meeting, um, I wanted to suggest reforms that kind of fit with what we know about <coughs> school spending and performance. 
And, and broadly, I think that one way to respond to district struggles is instead of suggesting reforms that limit choice, something that we've seen work positively in both uh, the conventional system and the charter system, is instead question how can we empower districts to make, to react further to enrollment fluctuations and other difficulties. And uh, my recommendations fall in three broad categories. Providing more authority to retain and reward effective staff. <coughs> Um, empowering districts to further innovate and compete. Ask ourselves, how can we have more Berrien Springs? And then provide support directly to students for educational needs. Uh, the first is educational policy is personnel policy. Um, education spending within a district, I mean, a, r a rule of thumb is staff costs are about 80% about of expenses. You know, that's significant. Um, and as I mentioned before, and I think probably given diverse backgrounds, all of us would agree that no factor is more important than teacher quality. So one recommendation that is on the top of my mind is extending Public Act 103 of 2011, which prohibited additional subjects of bargaining such as evaluation, observation, layoff, and recall to other district staff members. And the reason I bring this to your attention is um, just a week and a half ago, the Mackinac Center had an event with uh, Representative Yonker, the original sponsor of that legislation, that was heavily attended by a number of district officials. And one thing that we heard there, because we had, uh, we had reviewed district contracts to see whether these um, prohibited subjects were still in there. And we had published information that said as many as 60% of districts had this language in some way in their contract. And uh, quite frankly, we weren't expecting such a positive response from school administrators but we really had a number of them reach out to us <coughs> as a resource. And one of the things they said was that their lives would be easier if PA 103 were extended to other district staff members, with the understanding that uh, just as it's important to retain and reward successful teachers, why wouldn't it also be important to retain and reward uh, other staff members on the basis of merit? Um, the, other, the other point I have here is perhaps a more vague point but I wonder if there's an opportunity for the department or the board to somehow support the development of new policies in light of these reforms, given the varied response to them. Uh, removing barriers limiting district innovation. I, I, I honestly do think that um, you could make the argument that districts are at a disadvantage when competing for students. So the question is how do you give, like how do you help them how you give them the opportunity to compete and innovate. One way to do it would be to remove geographic barriers limiting districts from receiving state aid for non-resident students. Right now, uh, as I said, School of Choice is a rich and robust system, but 105 and 105C are um, limiting that choice either within the district's ISD or to districts that are within ISDs contiguous to it. So why not remove that, why not expand it entirely? The second would be to allow districts to open schools outside of their geographic boundaries. And while this might sound um, strange or something that you know we've never heard of, I, again, I would, I would point to Berrien Springs with an alternative education center outside of its district boundaries. I would, I would wonder if other districts that might have a specialization in a certain program could perhaps expand their enrollment in this way. Uh, if there's any opportunities out there to allow further district and school specialization, I think that could certainly help districts attract students. And then finally, um, you know, it, it seems as if an effort to identify other ways to remove barriers could actually be quite a positive conversation to have among stakeholders. I, 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 I maybe, you know, in the Q&A you'll tell me why people wouldn't be interested in that, but I, I see that as a very <coughs> interesting conversation to have among legislators and school administrators. And then finally, supporting students directly. And um, when, I, when I say that, I, I wanted to direct your attention to the Arizona Empowerment Scholarship Accounts, um, just as a new and innovative way for providing support to families with students who have additional needs. Uh, the Arizona, the ESA, um, Education Saving Account or Empowerment Scholarship Account, uh, is basically a debit card that can be used for a whole host of costs. In Arizona, it, it includes tuition, but it also includes tutoring, education therapy services and aids, homeschooling expenses, textbooks, virtual education, and other costs. 
Um, the other thing that you would probably find interesting is that different amounts are providing to students, provided to students of different needs. So there's differentiated funding depending on what need that child has. Um, I, I see it as an innovative way to support these students. And I wonder, again, um, you know, obviously, given the Constitution, the tuition is off the table, but if there might be a way to provide support to students who need it, who are facing these additional struggles, in a way that empowers families and perhaps could ease the burden on our schools. So uh, with that said, I'm sure that you have questions, and I'd be happy to take them. Well, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate the presentation and the thought you put into it. John. And, and, and thank you for uh, the concise, uh, <laughs> less uh, infatuated with your own voice than some, some, of, our, our some of our academic. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, thank you very much. Very thoughtful. Uh, again. So um, you, we, we may not find the, the debate about are we spending enough in the historical trends. Uh, uh, that may not be the place where we find much common ground, though I, I would note you know, the, even your long-term pictures, say the last dozen years or so, have been a real real dollar decline. But um, looking for that common ground, which I know we all share, if there is some to help us improve outcomes. And I wanted to see, could you talk a little more about spending money differently? And in, in fact, a couple of your recommendations begin to get to some of the potential areas we've heard some um, I don't know if it's consensus, but some direction from many that um, we uh, should be potentially spending money differently, putting dif differential weights or disproportionate amount of resources against certain needs or opportunities. Um, I guess the two that, that, that I've been hearing most about or seeing most about, one was uh, poor kids and kids with um, more diverse needs for additional services, and the other is teacher uh, training and professional development and evaluation, not necessarily teacher pay. I mean, your scattergram sort of tested outcomes relative to paying teachers more. You didn't have any that said teacher professional development, teacher training, uh, or um, poor kids. And uh, we recommendations are even speaking to the impact of uh, spending more for kids with more needs or the importance of teacher evaluation and teacher um, training in some sense. So if you, are there areas where you think we should be spending more money or spending the money we have differently to get better outcomes? What would be those key areas? Uh, and particularly in an era of a foundation grant where we're seeing sort of counter arguments that we need to equalize the funding for all students versus this very powerful argument that equity really means spending the amount of money needed to help kids succeed and that may be different for different children or it means maybe putting money in different places than we are currently. Sure. Um, I, I will just note that with the, the lack of a relationship with teacher pay, I would, I would consider that um, the salary schedule probably has a lot to do with that lack of relationship. Um, so in terms of differentiated funding, I, I think there's, you, you put it, you came right to the point of it, is you are hearing different, you are hearing different perspectives. You are hearing on the one side we should all get the same dollar amount, and the other side you're hearing that there are different needs. I would um, urge humility in some respects. And what I mean by that is I think that there, especially with um, egregious need, perhaps there is an opportunity to do analysis and say, you know, we can, we can tell that, there, that more money is needed here. Um, but at the same time, I would be cautious of undertaking an attempt to, for the state to tell districts we know how much it takes to educate these childs on these hosts of characteristics. And what I mean by that is I think that if you did that, you would be removing, um, per, you, well, I mean, you would be making a judgment that you know what that child costs in this particular district when the district might have a different system of addressing those needs and might actually feel that, you know, this child of a different need is more costly for them to educate. So there might be some opportunity there, especially for children of special needs, to make those considerations. But um, I wonder, especially if you consider a child from, say a child who qualifies for free lunch, right? Is that child, um, perhaps that child might be more expensive to educate in the Detroit area versus in the Upper Peninsula, right? Um, so I, I, I question whether the state could completely identify that. I would, I would urge instead um, empowering districts in any way you could uh, to address, either address those needs or to provide funding to families 
to address those needs and give the families um, an incentive to spend that money correctly. Uh, so the ESAs, for example, roll over. If you don't use them, they can be spent um, on the child's college, right? That gives families a, a great incentive to think about that money carefully, as opposed to just say, I got this amount, I use it up on my social services every year. Um, so perhaps there's an avenue there for addressing those needs without simply expanding uh, what we ask school districts to do. May I just ask, kind of <clears throat> furthering John's point, you, you call for the department perhaps to decide or study where does spending have an impact. So how might that reconcile with what you just saying? Sure. Um, so I would, I would focus on the, um, what schools are doing now and whether there is a relationship there between spending and outcomes. So, I, so there's a, the, the notion of the, the adequacy study, right? It can't simply be that what we're spending now is necessarily what is adequate, right? Because we're seeing this great range. So um, what I'm recommending instead is to see if there is a relationship within some of these schools where it is being spent effectively to use that as guidance for the recommendations in terms of where we might spend money more effectively. Thank you. Richard, please. <coughs> um, segue uh, into, uh, on page four, you have the um, uh, measure of uh, increase in spending and SAT scores uh, uh, remain the same. Of course, scholastic aptitude test is supposed to, supposed to test aptitude which is supposed to be unaffected by teaching. Mm -hmm. In other words, scholastic aptitude test traditionally tests something close to or akin to IQ, which theoretically is not affected by, it's an innate ability uh, which is not itself affected by teaching or, or the quality of teaching or, or whatever else. It might be obscured by really bad teaching or, or physical injury or something like that. But, but um, and, and that points to, I mean, if anyone assumed that spending would compensate for aptitude, that was a faulty expectation. So, and, and, and may I just make the connection that in education we sometimes get caught up in rhetoric which is uh, unrealistic. No matter how much we spend, our kids will not become, a, all of our, 100% of our kids will not become above average. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's, that's an unrealistic <laughs> expectation. Despite like way the world is on. There you go. <laughs> and and, and uh, some of the expectations that, that we've had of our schools, I think, have fallen into that, into that area. So, so the, um, the author in the effort to create a longer-term trend line, what he did is he, as I said, he controlled for those variables, but then he tested his model against NAEP, NAEP test scores, and with the understanding that this model would be a proxy for NAEP. So if he could look at say 2003 NAEP scores and see that his model was predicting that the same outcomes for the same states in terms of ranking of those states as, as proved by NAEP, mm -hmm. that he would consider that to be a fair model. So I would, I would argue that if we use uh, NAEP to measure the effectiveness at our schools, that I think this model is certainly instructional, right? Because he benchmarked it to NAEP. Um, and there's a, there's a very complex paper that explains exactly how, but his, his, his intent was to create a sub, like, to extend what we know from me further backwards. Um, to your point about ex, uh, expecting all students to be above average, I agree with you that we do get caught up in um, the rhetoric. And I do think that one, especially with this election year, that one question has been, you know, will more money improve outcomes? Will more money improve the state of our schools? And so. With that being said, I, I almost feel as if we do need to have that conversation. And, and I'll just add, you know, the, the next slide was, was NAEP. It was not the SAT. Thank you. Dan? Um, Kathleen? I have three questions. So I'll ask the one and then get first and then get back in the queue. That's oh. our, um, okay. our process now uh, when we have a long line. So, um, Around the subject of school choice, would you go, I don't want to say so far, uh, um, would you require 
that all districts, all schools, everywhere be choice place? In other words, if you're Gross Point, you couldn't keep Detroit students out of your school, for example, right? To take one highly kind of politicized mm -hmm. example. Would you go so far as to require districts to open themselves in that way? The, uh, in the center's study of school of choice, we do make that rec recommendation with limits. We recommend that districts open up their borders to um, a minimum of 5% of their enrollment. So not, I think the fear in gross points is the floodgates, right? The floodgates that would come into gross point. Um, on, a, on a personal level, I wonder where there are private schools that say, if you don't live in these neighborhoods, you can't attend. And I, I, that's, I feel for our, um, our public education system, it's almost, uh, it's, it's, it's questionable why these borders are considered to be barriers when we would be uh, apoplectic if private schools operated that way. Correct. Kathleen? Well, and then back uh, to a follow-up question about the schools of choice. You use Berry and Springs as an example. If they, if their enrollment increased, was it 45 percent or something like that? Those students came from other districts. Those districts lost money mm -hmm. and made it harder for them to educate the children that were left in their districts. So I don't know if th this, this has got maybe pluses for one district and minuses for many other districts. So it's not all as easy as it, you make it sound, mm -hmm. it seems to me. I, Varian, uh, Varian Springs, in that case, the superintendent looked around and said, where are students not being served? And he felt that there was a, a dire need for alternative education services in that area. It, in my mind, um, the, ultimate, the ultimate concern should be of the students. So in that case, if Varian Springs was meeting a need that other districts were not, um, I, I do view that as a net positive. Well, I'm glad they're serving a need, you know, filling a need. That's that's good. But every every solution creates other problems. It's good for one and not good for the other. Maybe. Um, similarly, if uh, we were to say, you know, this the school of choice system is awful. Let's stop it entirely. Right? That would hurt Berrien Springs. You know, so absolutely, in, in pretty much any situation, there are trade-offs. But the important thing here is, you know, how can we improve outcomes for students? And if, if school of choice is enabling students to go to districts with better educational outcomes, or perhaps have their needs being met that they aren't being met, met elsewhere, I do think that that's a trade-off that we should be willing to make. Well, thank you. I'll pass for that. We'll come back later. Before I go back to Dan, was someone else in the queue? Gary? I'm not in the queue, but I'd like to be in the queue. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're new dad here, so okay. please just jump in. The, you oh, have, next? Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, I really appreciated your presentation, and I really zoned in on the encouragement to allow schools to be able to innovate. Mm -hmm. um, the, ex the example of Berrien Springs is a great one, and they have a really strong ISD with some really innovative thinkers there like Kevin Clark and some others. One of the things that I wondered relates to when you looked at students who left a district and you considered them a vote. Did you adjust for the, the characteristics of those students, and could you talk a little bit about which students were the ones who left in the choice program? Mm -hmm. Were they the ones who could, or perhaps the ones who were, had perhaps the aptitude that, that would encourage them to leave? Could you speak a little bit about that? And then I have a second question, which might come up later, um, regarding the merit pay recommendations. Sure. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, the data that we used for the school choice study was um, the SEPI non-resident research school and um, it did not provide data on what students left, which students right. left, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I, I acknowledge your point, right? Your point is that perhaps the students who left right. would be ones who have the parents who are willing to drive them, mm -hmm. for example. Um, I, I think that's a fine point. Um, I, would, I would just say, you know, absolutely, we should be concerned about the students who didn't leave, but that I, I question whether that concern is reason enough to limit those students, especially when they're choosing districts where academic outcomes are better. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I'll wait for the next okay. in the queue. Okay. Is there anyone else in the queue before Dan? And back to, back to Dan. Great. Number two. Um, uh, so one of the 
I think, yeah, I'm going to switch my order just because this builds right off of Gary's point. By the way, great stuff. Love the Detroit oh, Tigers. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank um, you. And the tie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all need to be celebratory around opening day. It is spring um, in Michigan. Someone said it anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the calendar says that. Um, so one of the one of the things that that has happened. So Detroit is a pretty robust choice market. I'm assuming we can all agree on mm -hmm. that. Um, given the, the uh, we've had kind of more charters and more charter growth in Detroit than in many places. Frankly, your your numbers around choice I think underestimated because we we've seen a lot of kids. Um, and this is no statement about uh, kind of quality of, but there are a lot of kids that go to DPS as a matter of choice, having gone to charters and now back and vice versa. There's I mean, Detroit is a very robust and um, and has been for a long time choice marketplace around education. Um, and one of the things that we've seen, I would argue, is kind of the absence of government-funded infrastructure to support choice leaves wealthier families better able to exercise choice than poorer families, than families with less means. Um, and so, for example, in a city without a great mass transit system, and we can talk about whether that should be fixed on that side, but typically schools are providing their own transportation. In a city without a great mass transit system, we see higher wealth families exercising choice more, and I would argue kind of more effectively, meaning they can get further distances to the great school across town than a family without the same means of transportation. And the argument has been made that, in fact, if we're going to have a choice public school system, that we have to publicly fund the mechanisms to allow all to equitably access that choice, right? So DC, for example, the office of the state superintendent, and it's not actually the state superintendent much like Michigan or any other state because it is a city, um, but that office, effectively, let's call it kind of a uh, akin to the mayor's office, but just for education, operates transportation for the whole city for schools, um, regardless of type of school. So if you are a child going to a DCPS school, that office operates the bus system for you, and if you're a child going to a charter school, that operates the bus system for you, um, so that kids can actually get to anywhere in the city. Would you be supportive of, uh, and so I guess it's a two-part question here. One is, excess choice, one would argue, is remarkably inefficient, right? So if you just take the economic argument, and in, let's use Detroit as an example, where our best estimate in my other life is that we have probably 20,000 more seats than kids in Detroit. And that level of excess supply creates all sorts of inefficiencies. Would you be in favor of some form of regulation of that marketplace so that the excess supply was not so inefficient, was maybe 5% or 10% instead of 20%? One, A, A, <laughs> and B, um, are you supportive of government funded infrastructure, publicly funded infrastructure to support choice so that a family without the same means, um, privately available, can still get their child to a grade school across town, whether that is a DPS school or a charter school or what have you? Okay. Uh, great, great points. Great points, both of them. So the first part A, um, opening a charter school is not an assurance of enrollment. Right? And opening a charter school is a financial risk. It's a big financial risk. Uh, I, I actually I sat on the board of um, Taylor Prep, an NHA school that opened this past fall. And until the you know until first day of school, you don't know what your enrollment is. So while there might be an, an inefficiency there, I would argue um, you've heard great presentations about uh, the for-profit management charter companies, right? If, if they think that there's an opportunity and there isn't, I'm comfortable with letting them lose that investment and take that risk. <coughs> so I don't see a great need for us to regulate it further. In fact, I would worry that we would um, see some, what we interpret to be an inefficiency that could in fact be a different way of addressing a need that we just, we just aren't aware of. So I'm, I'm fine with letting them take that risk. Uh, the second point regarding um, public transportation 
many, many charter schools do offer transportation. Uh, so I, it's not as just as if the charter schools do not offer that transportation. This is not a charter school question. Let me just be, it's I'm like sorry to interrupt, but let me just be clear. All right, that's all right. Yeah. So lots of schools in Detroit, charter and traditional, offer transportation, right? And I'm just using Detroit as an example because I know it best. Mm -hmm. Most of those schools offer transportation with, with boundary limits, something like a half mile or three quarters of a mile or a mile from the school. Detroit is much larger than that, right? And if you actually wanted families to have the ability to choose a great school wherever it is, a school three miles away that offers public offers transportation, but only for students who live within three quarters of a mile radius of the school, doesn't get it for you, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, that, mean, so that's the example. It's not charter, or I mean, that's DPS, yeah. for example. It, it's, yeah. So it's not a charter question. It is a publicly funded infrastructure to support choice mm -hmm. because otherwise it seems to me that it just benefits the wealthiest families mm -hmm. right and leaves the families that have less income and less ability to actually like physically access the choice it leaves them at greater risk of not being able to actually exercise it okay mm -hmm. uh, so just um, one one pushback on the wealthy families argument uh, I charter schools open where there is where they believe there's a, a need Right, so I would I would argue that at least there's a, a good chance that a charter school would open in an area where there is an opportunity to walk to school or take your child to school on the way to work. But the greater question about uh, supporting choice through transportation, honestly, um, it's something that I hadn't considered. It's not something that I would have a knee-jerk reaction against to. I think the devil would be in the details, right? In your example, what would happen uh, for the districts that already are providing busing? You know, it would be it would be a detailed question. If it could be done relatively cheaply, it would likely accelerate choice in the area. All right, a little, I'm just a little. I, when I was Wayne County Reese's superintendent, we tried to install in effect a countywide transportation system. Paid two hundred grand for a study to do so for some of these reasons that you're getting at, and that might be a possible solution is putting some of that in the hands of an ISD to try to think about routes and make more efficient the 34 separate public ed transportation systems in Wayne County. But just a, mm -hmm. a thought. Good question. I think Cassandra. And then, Dan again. And then I'll get back in the queue. <laughs> right. Um, just a quick question about the, the choice issue. Do you think that, or does the Mackinac Center think that, Choice for choice sake is a worthy goal, or do you think the state should have more of an of a strategy on what choice should look like? And if so, what would that strategy look like? So, for for choice, right? A, ch a child doesn't attend, doesn't use school of choice or a charter school unless the parents did made that decision. It's a an active decision. It's not a passive decision. So in, in general, I would, looking at the credo study, looking at the empirical studies of full choice, I would tend to side in this case with the parents and whether they feel that they need a different option. Um, one thing I didn't mention, I apologize, it was on the slide, but I didn't mention this. Uh, the school of choice market now, almost every district loses at least one child in the state throughout the entire state, in every rural corner of the state. Um, a child uses school of choice. So the point being that a district is not always the best fit for a child. There isn't a one-size-fits-all model. Um, I think that the other question to ask is, and this probably is what you're getting at a little bit, alluding to, is the notion that um, some choices are better than others, or some choices are worse than others. And one uh, challenge I would have to a question about, say, limiting um, charter choice is I would challenge you to think about, would you also recommend the same limitation for school of choice? And if not, why? Uh, why? Why would there be a difference in how you view that mechanism of choice versus choice in our conventional district? I'm not sure maybe I didn't ans ask the question correctly, because um, that's not actually what I was getting at at all. My question has to do more with, there is somewhat of a zero-sum game here, right? So. For every child who leaves a school, there's a school left that has to educate the kids who are still there, but they have less funding and things like that to do that with. Um, and so I'm just in the context of understanding that there, there is, um, there are, for every action, there's, there's an opposite and equal reaction. Um, so 
then we have to think more broadly of you know not only helping students but also not hurting students at the same time so my question has to do more with um, if that is the understanding how do we create the best system where everyone gets to win as opposed to just some kids? And, or is that not something we should be considering? Okay, so that I think gets at my points about district, uh, abil giving districts greater ability to compete and innovate um, and giving districts greater ability to react to enrollment changes. Um, I, I, I can certainly see that with the series of presentations and the perspectives that you all are considering, there is the, um, stress between preserving the district system and allowing choice. And um, at the end of the day, from my perspective, I would, I would value the authority of parents to make that choice. So what I would do is give the districts any tools we can to respond or perhaps further compete. But I wouldn't view um, a district, uh, for example, um, Highland Park would be a great example where school, where the enrollment dramatically declined. I wouldn't use them as a reason to limit students' options. Thank you. Like your new glasses, Michelle. Oh, well, thank you. Hi. <coughs> um, first, I wanted to compliment you on another study that you did where you looked at the correlation between the top to bottom lists and poverty. And I also wanted, I, you know, I hear people saying that teachers are the most important factor and I went to the study that sort of um, seems to be the foremost on this, um, done by the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And what they actually said was that the first and most solidly based finding is that the largest <clears throat> source of variation in student learning is attributable to differences in what students bring to school, their abilities and attitudes, the family and community background. Secondly, if you're just looking at in-school influence, then that's teacher quality. So when we're looking at the variations um, on your charts, I don't see your other study sort of coming in here where the economic or the uh, academic outcomes might be influenced by our high concentrations of poverty, which is so unique in Michigan, different from other states. And when we look at a state average, where the test results are low, um, I would argue that, and I, as a resident of Detroit and a mother of many children, um, that these reforms are suppressing our academic uh, a uh, achievement. Um, and because, as Dan pointed out, um, sort of uh, a lot of what's happening in Detroit with school closings, people are moving, taking their kids. I have one of my kids out of district. Um, and it's because of my sort of the um, the lack of concern around special education and, and reforms. So um, I guess my question is, um, why is there not a perspective about the economic um, backgrounds, particularly <coughs> by district, when you're looking at high high concentrations of poverty? We have pockets all over the state, um, and how that might influence, as well as spending and as well as outcomes. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate your question, um, okay. and I appreciate your comments on our study. I know that we don't share much, uh, we may not share many, uh, share, many uh, share many principles, but I think um, it's great that we can find common ground. Right. Um, the reason I use the top to bottom ranking is honestly, I put my ego aside. <laughs> so yeah. right, this is the ranking that the state uses. So I wanted to put mm -hmm. that before you because that's what the department uses. Um, the, the, the studies that I'm referencing regarding spending versus outcomes, they absolutely include uh, uh, pr student poverty. They, it they would be remiss if they didn't. I mean, what you just stated is something that's a known fact, right? So if they didn't include it, that would be, you know, you can't, ta you can't take it at its face value. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, Michigan has such a rich amount of data on spending that um, I think that a uh, close examination of spending and outcomes is quite feasible here, given um, just the granular level of what CEPI has. Um, in, in terms of uh, poverty and outcomes, I, you know, I think that that's why, why we need to take it into account and then use that information to inform decisions. So um, I'm, I'm sorry if I, can you repeat your final question? Well, 
I, what I what I hear you saying is that poverty is in these studies, although it's not graphed. Mm -hmm. I don't see it identified, so it's it's sort of confusing. I know that there was something somewhere where there was an adjusted. I guess on page four, yeah, the, the trends. But I, although I'm not quite sure what that means, but um, it seems that <clears throat> it's not just a matter of spending has no influence on outcomes. I think there's it's spending. It's this you know it's the population that you have. It's the issues that the, that are in that community. Um, it's uh, it, 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 it. So I guess, why why wasn't poverty charted? Why wasn't that considered? And um, and I know it's I guess you're saying it's somewhat considered um, here. So but. the uh, the Michigan the 1996 study that did include a host of uh, variables regarding student um, poverty and struggles. It included uh, parental income level. It included student race. Um, it also included whether a student was eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Um, it included whether the district was in an urban or rural area. So the authors of that particular study regarding Michigan spending versus outcomes carefully considered the factors that you're talking about. Um, and I, I guess I would just agree with you the importance of including those factors. But when they did, they still did not find that relationship. So they're saying that regardless of the spending and adjusting for the population, maybe I'm just missing it, um, that spending in the classroom doesn't matter? Is that what you're saying? That is what they found. And when you say spending in the classroom, they were looking at uh, spending at the district and building level. So, so the question, what I, the, the point here is that um, I agree with you that spending in the classroom should matter. So the question is, what is it that is causing this us to not see that relationship? Is there a way where we could structure spending where we would see that more dollars would, in fact, have a better impact? Question. Mm -hmm. I have a couple other questions, but I can wait my turn. Okay. Dan, then Gary, then back to Michelle. Um, all right, number three. Uh, by the way, so let me offer this. So the, I, I, I believe uh, that there are more charter schools in Detroit than DPS schools in Detroit mm -hmm. buildings, right? Um, uh, and so my questions kind of frequently come from that context, and I get that statewide it's a very different picture, but in Detroit, um, uh, <coughs> charter schools are, if not the majority of the market, uh, certainly kind of the plurality of the market. Um, okay, so third, accountability in this context. Uh, so there are many folks who would argue that kind of let the marketplace hold schools accountable, right? And the families kind of as they deselect the lowest performing schools, those schools will naturally close. Um, I don't know that we've actually seen that occur. One, just from an empirical perspective, um, be interested in your perspective on that and if there are examples that you would point to of, of, uh, of that. Um, uh, and that's across governance, so charters and traditional uh, schools, district schools. Um, and second, kind of in contrast to that, your perspectives on the um, kind of need for a public accountability structure that would force those schools to close um, that are underperforming as opposed to waiting for the marketplace to do so if it would eventually, if ever, do so. Okay. So the. Um This, this chart, I would say, answers some of your question about the market, in my mind, right? Because it seems pretty consistently that students using at least this form of choice are choosing districts where academic outcomes are higher. So I, um, I, would, I would point to that. I, I, think that that's a, I think that's a good starting point. I would also agree that um, it's, it's a tricky issue. I think, you know, obviously Excellence Schools Detroit is to pro trying to provide this information to the market to say, you know, these are good schools, don't go to these other schools. And I, I think that efforts like that on the community side and the nonprofit world side are, ex are incredibly important and helpful. Um, I, the, as far as the accountability in terms of where the state shuts down schools, um, it's, it's a difficult question because obviously if the, if the yardstick is wrong or if the yardstick is flawed, 
that can have a great impact, especially regarding um, the point <coughs> that uh, Michelle brought up regarding poverty. So again, I think that uh, we should talk about a little bit about caution. Um, if there is an effort, if there, I wish that there were a way where we could have some uh, incredible instrument that would tell us exactly a school's quality and how it relates to every child. But as you know, especially with the Detroit area, right, the other options might not be that great. So the question is, is this the best option for that child? And that, for me, would give me pause before developing some uh, mathematical model in the state, at the state level to determine whether a school should be closed. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, so let's assume that you're right, and there is some marginal uptick in the number of students who choose a higher performing school by whatever yardstick, right? Um, there's a pretty good case to be made at this point that, um, at least based on the empirical evidence, that the poorer performing school is not so deselected. It's like not, there aren't so many students that leave it that it is forced to close due to just these marketplace pressures. or. I, I, that's really a question, I guess. Would you agree with that assessment, or, or no? Do you think that there are examples that, like, that that's actually bound to happen, so on and so forth? Yeah, yeah. It just seems like we have a ton of folks limping along, charters and traditional, who are not good schools, <coughs> or who are underperforming by the measures we have, right, the yardsticks we have, and the marketplace isn't closing them. This, I mean, that's just to push on you a little bit. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a valid push, right? Uh, you, you can think about um, what, in, the, in those cases, what information are the parents using to make their decision um, and what they're valuing. I, I guess what I would, what I would uh, say is that is, are, the, are there so many of those schools that we should take on the risk of accidentally closing one that might be providing a great value to students. And I think that would just need, um, you might need more analysis to answer that question. I'm obviously gonna recognize any board member that wants to speak, just a reminder that Ed Trust and Amber and Sarah, so we're a tad mm -hmm. over time, but that's, that's at your uh, leisure. That Did you have a question, Gary? I do, if, it, it if was, it's it possible. Was, oh, yes. it, it was Gary, and then Michelle, and then <laughs> Kathleen. Thank you. No, I'm ready to do that. I'm just trying to. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be quick. I'll, I'll be. No, I'm not even. <laughs> <laughs> I see John looking up. at the clock, so yeah, I'm trying yes, to play yeah, yeah, chair certainly. here. That's all. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to address the idea. One of your recommendations was a reform for retaining and rewarding educators who are effective at their jobs. Um, you may have heard that I was featured in a story by your organization earlier this year, recognizing the fact that I was disproportionately compensated um, to the award that I was recognized for. So this is an, a, a near and dear issue to my heart. One of the things that I have not seen in the recommendation for a merit pay system here in this state or, or really anywhere around the country is focusing on much more than standardized test scores of students. Mm -hmm. And while that is a component of the work that we do as teachers, I believe that's so narrow-minded and one-dimensional that it shouldn't be considered for the basis of a merit pay system because there's a couple of things assumed. Um, the first is that we assume teachers lack the motivation to teach. And that really presupposes that we're in this business for something other than we are. And I, I have not come across an educator who's not in front of their students to help them grow and achieve. Um, the other thing is we're trying to put a dollar amount on motivation. Um, and so I'll use Leslie Schools as an example. Um, have an opportunity to visit with some of their, their staff, I've learned that they have a really robust merit pay system. Um, your organization's written about them as well. They compensate their highly effective teachers at most $400 per year. Um, what that includes is that they are rated highly effective on their evaluation, that they've gone above and beyond their required professional development, they've attended outside of school functions, and they've participated in committee work in a number of different ways. $400 a year can't even buy you an Xbox. So I'm not certain how the recommendation that schools adopt a policy where we compensate the most effective teachers who are impacting our children, and as a new dad, this is a big deal to me. With $400, <laughs> I don't think that $400 is going to make a difference. And so I would love to hear from you, how can we make a more sophisticated accountability and, as you're calling it, merit pay system 
that would not just entice and incentivize, but rather truly reward. Because the, the research on motivation um, in the psychological world shows that if then reward systems are not effective. Um, and so I'd love to hear where do all those things kind of play into your recommendation for merit pay? Yeah, so um, the recommendation to retain and reward effective teachers is not only just about merit pay. It's also okay. about um, making decisions based on performance <coughs> as opposed to seniority, mm -hmm. right? So um, if, uh, if, if there were dramatic layoffs in Gross Point, you know, you would be more likely to get a pink slip mm -hmm. because you're younger. Um, in terms of merit pay, yeah, absolutely. I think it's frankly uh, insulting, even at $400, to get only $400 for stellar performance and being recognized by your colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mackinac Center actually did a lot of work last year to highlight districts where their merit pay was $1 or perhaps $10, you know, and that that's not really a merit pay system. So, um, and I, I completely agree with you as well that uh, test scores alone should not determine those increases, absolutely. I mean, I certainly work at an organization where performance is measured on a number of factors, right? Probably most anyone works in an environment where your performance is not simply determined by uh, widgets, effectively. Sure. So, what the, the details or the thought behind that recommendation is more along the lines of really taking a look at the system and saying, can we pay teachers who fill more difficult to fill positions highly to reflect that need? I think that would be a great, a great move. Can we give, can we accelerate salary increases year to year for stellar performance? That would be a great move. Uh, would it be a, a signal to tell a teacher that, you know, we didn't quite see great performance this year to just say, you know, this year, just no salary increase or marginal, right? I think those types of systems uh, could in fact encourage uh, stellar teachers and honestly also encourage people who have the potential to be stellar teachers to enter the workplace. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Michelle and then Kathleen. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, mention, uh, I wanted to go actually talk about uh, finances um, and I'm concerned about MESPERS and um, the effect that um, uh, what's happening now, you know, we I talked to um, this uh, superintendent in Kalamazoo, which is the fastest growing um, <clears throat> enrollment in the state, and they, they're taking cuts because of the MESPERS. And part of the reason is because the expansion of charters and the expansion of um, EAA, which excludes um, teachers from participating in this system. So it's creating a huge burden on the schools that do provide a decent pension for their personnel. And, um, and have that commitment to do so. Um, so, I've, I, that's, I think that's exciting. Exciting. she's voicing her <laughs> opinion. She's coming or going. Yeah. So I'm concerned with where this is heading. You know, I live in Detroit and I'm seeing what ha happened with the police and the um, city workers um, who, you know, it, to a point where there's, is it, if, the, if the system faces bankruptcy because of this, and is that a responsible, um, financial uh, policy to bankrupt this pension. So my question to you is, what do you see as a way to lessen the burden on the school districts that provide a decent pension to uh, the, the folks who work there? Um, so we, we have published work recommending changes to MIPSERS to deal with this problem. Yeah. And I believe it is a problem with MIPSERS. Uh, and I don't know the extent that you all can have an impact or not, but MIPSERS absolutely needs to be addressed in terms of the costs. Um, to the point about the charter school teachers not participating or being a drain. Being excluded. Uh -huh. um, I believe that, I know um, Glep has run the numbers, but I believe it's the number of charter school teachers relative to the number of conventional district teachers is very small, first. And second, when we're talking about chronic underfunding year after year, then the fact that we don't have more teachers in that system is probably helping. Uh, so I, I think what I would do is I would, I would go, I would just, I would go to MIPSERS itself and talk about reform there. That would be where I would go. You would suggest? We have suggested, um, we've suggested freezing, freezing MIPSERS and um, closing, closing the system and freezing it. Um, and perhaps there would be a um, period of time to let current employees adjust their uh, retirement expectations or plans so accordingly. So cut their pension. Yeah. And not have pension or 
uh, assistant for people in charter schools, the t people who teach in there, they would not have. So a, 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 defined benefit, a defined benefit system so would be a more responsible financial system. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And they would be matched by, like, I don't know. At Wayne State, we match ours two to one. So the university matches two. For every 5%, we get 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a system like that would be responsible also for the employee. You know it's going to be there, right? Yeah, no, I don't because the stock market goes up and down, and a lot of people have <laughs> refused to retire. So we have a lot of faculty that would like to retire and can't. We got a lot of young faculty <laughs> that like to come in and can't. But I don't, I'm not a big fan, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Kathleen, and then Eileen, I don't know if you have anything if you're still on the phone. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I want to steal. I am. I am. I'm listening, and uh, uh, very glad that we were able to have Audrey come. Okay. I wanted to steal Lupe's thunder and say we have to give Amber even yes. time. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, but I just wanted. To, I'm. I'm so glad we have Gary as our teacher of the year. Yeah. Mm. It states things in such a clear way and so yeah. effectively. It's a great to have you here. You say what I think and it's, you say it better. So. <laughs> but I, what I was concerned about, speaking of MISPRs, uh, your figures on the, the large increase in uh, spending of, for education, if you go back to 44, it you know, was a whole different system. This, this district, I was not included in the education budget per se. Mm -hmm. And then it changed 20 years ago with Proposal A. It's a completely different proposition. So it's not a fair, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a fair statement to say that it's increased 500% because you're including MISPRs in the education budget since 20 years ago and not before that. Mm -hmm. So I think that needs to be clarified somehow in your presentation. Well, we're still, um, we're still spending that money on the we're education system. We're still spending system. the money, but you, you make it sound like it, it's, a, it's a different way of putting it. it, it it's, the, the districts are now responsible for it. From a state level perspective, uh, I in, I believe that that funding is that that funding is being spent on the educational system. So if the issue is MIPSERS, which I think a lot of us would agree that it's part of the issue, then the issue needs to be fixing MIPSERS, not um, simply just failing to exclude the cost or excuse me, failing to account for the cost of MIPSERS when we talk about the cost of the education system. I, sounds like we <laughs> sounds like we've wrapped up. And Audrey, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us and thank presenting you. your thinking on this, mm -hmm. and also for helping the state board hone its skills as it's getting ready to interview down the road a new state superintendent <laughs> candidate. <laughs> Good. Thanks so much. Audrey. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, dealing with uh, all these questions, Audrey. Very much. And yeah, um, <clears throat> Amber. Ariano and Sarah Lenhoff are with us. Uh, Amber is the executive director of Ed Trust Midwest. We all know Ed Trust and Katie Hancock, one of our premier education policy advocacy uh, and research groups. Thank you. Uh, very amazing. happy to have Amber and Sarah Thank with you. us. Uh, Amber, as you know, has been directing this organization for a few years, was a columnist at the Detroit News. And Sarah has been a leading researcher uh, and educator on teacher assessment. So thanks for coming, and thank you for sharing your perspective on what's important for us to know and do. Thank you. John, so I'd, I'd like to add that we can't thank you, Amber, and your organization enough for your support and strategy on getting us to smarter balance where we need to be on holding the course on fair, smart teacher evaluation systems. So I mean, you've been a real leader in that, and. Uh, Appreciate it very much. I wanted to say that publicly. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. I will, um, buenos dias. Um, again, my name is Amber Arellano. I'm the ED at the Education Trust Midwest. Um, I know we're probably running a little um, shorter on time now. Um, are we, are we, do we have a little bit more time because we'll of give, the We'll give you delay? an hour max. Okay. I don't know if we'll need all of that, so right. yeah. But if you, we can do yeah. better than that, that's great. Yeah. Up to my fellow board members, too. Yes. <laughs> well, we really appreciate the time today. It's good to be here, um, and it's good to be in Michigan in the spring. I'm sure we can all agree that it's, a, it's beautiful out right now. So we want to share um, a number of things. We're going we're gonna to share our um, – I, I can take – if you want me to do it. 
Um, we're going to share the findings of our new report. It just came out last week. It's our 2014 State of Michigan Education Report. Um, we're going to, um, we want to share the findings and give you an update on what the latest data tell us about how Michigan's doing compared to other states around the country. Um, we also want to talk about what we're learning from leading education states, including Massachusetts, which is the, really the highest performing education state in the country. If it, was a, if it was its own country, it would be a top six country in the world. And we also want to share um, some what we think are some hopeful news from the state of Tennessee. That's now um, the leading state for student growth in the nation. And um, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what we see are some of the, the, big, the big opportunities this year. Um, for Michigan to really turn around our education system, but we really want to keep that short because we know you, you really want to have a conversation, so we, we want to do that too. So for those of you that um, don't know us, we are um, affiliated with the National Education Trust. The National Ed Trust was the first organization in the country to open to provide a voice for students um, in national policy making and budget decisions. Um, and our mission is to raise student achievement for all students, but particularly for African American, Latino, and low income students. That's also our Michigan, um, Michigan mission. Um, and we are, as you know, um, nonpartisan. We work on both sides of the aisle. Um, our motto is, if you want what's best for kids, we'll work with you. Um, we don't care if you're a business organization, a grassroots organization, a nonprofit, if you're a conservative, liberal, um, and um, if, you know, what we're rooted in is what the research tells us over the last two decades actually works for kids and works for particularly for vulnerable students. Um, I just also want to highlight that our national office has a staff of about 70 people. Um, we have many teams, including higher education, um, K-16 finance expertise, um, a lot of K-12 policy and, um, and research expertise, a lot of data expertise. Many of you may know that we've worked in support of the department in Michigan's efforts to win the NCLB waiver. And I just, I want to offer that up as you, um, as you um, work over the, in the coming months and years, we, you know, we, we have that um, additional expertise there and, and we've really enjoyed, and I know I can speak for our national office, we've really enjoyed working with the MDE and working with the department as thought partners on a variety of buckets of work. So let's start with the good news, um, because there's a lot of bracing news that, um, that the data is now telling us. So the good news is, is that across the country, um, there's a lot to celebrate about how kids of color in particular, and even white students, are doing compared to um, how they were doing um, more than 20 years ago. We know, um, based on the new NAEP data, that um, black and brown students, are um, achievement rates have been rising significantly in reading. Um, and even though the gaps um, remain large um, between black and brown students and white students, they've narrowed by as much as 50%. Um, I want to show you a couple charts that give you a sense of um, that trajectory. This goes back to 1971, and we've seen major, huge, really, jumps over the last decade in achievement. This is for nine-year-old in reading, and again, for 13-year-old um, math. So that's that's really wonderful news, and, um, and so there's a lot that we can learn from what the country's doing for those students to raise um, student achievement. The bad news is, is that Michigan is not really part of that, of that rising tide. We are now um, in the bottom five states for student learning in fourth grade reading and math. We were one of um, only six states in the country that actually posted negative student growth in some subjects. And our fourth grade students are learning today at lower levels than they did in 2003 in learning. As you know, that is, that's devastatingly low achievement. And the reason why the fourth grade reading indicator is so worrisome is that, um, as you know, that's a really important predictor of future academic success. And frankly, even of future career success, right? I mean, even to get into the military, you, know, you have to have a basic level of, of literacy and math skills. Here's how we compare to states around the country. This was based on growth for fourth grade reading according to the NAEP. This was over a decade, 2003 to 13. You can see Tennessee at the top of the country for student growth. We're gonna talk about what they've done um, to get there. Massachusetts, even though Massachusetts is one of the highest performing states in the country, still get an amazing amount of growth for their students. Still, still knocking it out of the park in terms of improvement. 
you see the black line is um, the, the U.S. average. We're at the very bottom of the country. So if, if, um, if you imagine a race, one reason why we're performing so low in these indicators is that our students are actually learning at lower levels in some subjects than they did in 2003. But the other reason is that there's so many states that have done, have made major investments and have been putting really smart strategies into place over the last 15 to 20 years. And their growth is so outpacing ours. So it's, it's both of those things are happening in, in some of these subjects. This is, again, this is a, a closer look at what these um, high-performing high states, Tennessee, Minnesota, you can see, and again, Michigan, far below the national average. And I'm going to just go th quickly through some of, um, some of these slides and happy to circle back and answer questions about these for the sake of time. Um, you can see we're, we're, we've been declining compared to other states for all groups of students. We often hear from people, well, if it wasn't for Detroit, let's face it, we would be doing a lot better. The other thing we hear a lot in Lansing is, if it wasn't for those, those students, you know who we're talking about. We're talking about African American students, we're talking about Latino students, we're talking about poor students. Then we would, we would be doing great, right? We'd be, we'd be a top state, right? And the truth is, is that um, all of our students are suffering. Um, our, our black and brown students and our <coughs> low income students are really the canaries in the coal mine. So this is for overall performance, but if you look at African American students, we've not done well by our black students for a long, long time. That trend is continuing. Latino students have continued to make declines, um, and that was one of the few sort of bright spots on the horizon in Michigan. Um, we were above average um, for student achievement across the country. Um, Latino students have, um, have not been doing as well in recent years, and it's, it's worth, I think, further research about why that's going on. This is for higher, higher income students. Again, um, we've, we've fallen in ranks, fourth grade reading from 24th to 38th. And this data here is from the TUDA, which you probably know is one of really the only indicators that we have that compares um, Detroit student <coughs> achievement compared to other major urban metropolitan areas around the country. This is a really important baseline data slide because you can see here that Detroit is at the very bottom for achievement compared to all these other districts, far below the national large city average. This has changed very little from when Detroit first started doing um, <coughs> Detroit Public Schools first started participating in the TUDA. I think we, we have to um, applaud DPS for being part of the TUDA. It took a lot of courage to really to be part of this and to really put the data out there and to, to show how poorly they're doing compared to their peers around the country. Um, one of the saddest days in my career was when the, the NAEP experts came to Detroit and shared with DPS um, educators what this data said. Um, and literally there were more than 200 teachers, there was weeping in the room. That's how devastatingly bad and low this achievement is. And what that said to me was that these are not, these are not staff, these are not educators that don't care about their kids, and they're doing the best that they can. Um, but clearly, um, we're not doing right even by our educators, right? We're not providing the capacity and the support and the working cultures in so many high poverty schools and districts today to help um, make sure that those educators succeed. So last um, couple of slides on Michigan achievement. Um, so keep in mind where Detroit is compared to other urban districts around the country. Um, unfortunately, Detroit is not even in the top um, in the bottom 10 school districts in the state for low achievement. There are many others, and that's true for Latino achievement as well. This is for grade eighth, according to um, the 2003 MEEP. We also know that we have a major problem with um, performance in the charter sector. Today, our charter sector pretty much mirrors the, our traditional public school sector. Lots of variation, some high-performing charter schools, lots of mediocre schools, many um, very low performers. This is a slide that gives you a sense of, of how um, Detroit Charter and Detroit Public School um, schools stack up compared to one another. Um, the red bars are DPS schools. The blue bars are Detroit Charter schools. 
The gray bar is the, the statewide average for low income students. You can see there's only three schools that are, were part of this chart that actually outperform the statewide average for low income students. And unfortunately, many, both charter schools and Detroit public schools, underperforming not only the statewide average, but also the average for, um, for DPS. And again, that is horribly, tragically low achievement. Right? That's, that's terrible, terrible achievement. To give you a sense of that, what the NAEP said was that this achievement is so low that by the time these kids reach fourth grade, there's no evidence that they have spent time in a classroom that they could have stayed at home for the first three grades of their K-12 experience and they could have gotten the same level, showed the same level of learning. So for us, when we look at this data, um, it's sobering, uh, it's, it's bracing. Um, we, we, we don't think it's an overstatement to say that we're really face, facing an educational recession at the very least. Um, we know that our low achievement is true for white students and higher, um, higher income students as well. And that we know that we really have a statewide problem. It's not an urban problem, it's not a suburban problem, it's not a rural problem, it's not a minority problem, it's not an income problem. It's a statewide problem and we need statewide strategies to help our schools do better for our students. Last night I was on a radio show what one of the DJs said, well, maybe it's that our students have a bad attitude. Or maybe there's something wrong with our students. And I said, you know, we just don't buy into the argument that Michigan students are somehow innately in inferior than 46 other states' kids in the country, right? I mean, that's sort of a crazy notion, right? Um, and we know that, um, that first graders come to school with all the enthusiasm and hope of, you know, that. That's, that's a, a possible in, in lifetime, right, among human beings, right? So even when our K-3 students are among the lowest um, achievers in the country, we know it's not our kids, right? We know that it's us, it's the adults. And when I say us, I mean everybody. It's not just, this isn't about teachers, this isn't about principals, this is about state leadership, it's about the legislature, it's about the civic sector, it's about all of us that have a, um, a stake in this. So I want to I wanna share... Um, some of the findings that, that we've been um, learning and that we've been beginning to share around the state from some of the really leading education states around the country and what we can learn from them. Um, and Massachusetts in particular is nothing less than extraordinary. There's a lot that we can learn from Massachusetts. So I think um, and this will give you a sense of how high performing Massachusetts is. So Massachusetts is in the highest performing, um, if it was a country, this is, um, um, if, you could, if you could see the, the list of countries to the left there, it's probably too small for you to see, but, um, but we're, we're performing at the levels of the best countries in Asia and in Europe, right? Lots of people talk about Singapore and Japan and Finland. Massachusetts is right up, th is right up there with them. You can see what the U.S. public average is, and then you can see where Michigan is. We are, our um, student achievement levels are similar to a developing country. You can see um, that even though that even though Massachusetts is performing so um, so high at such high levels, even even then it's still making big gains for its um, for its students, including for its African American students. Here's um, its trajectory since 2003. Again, compared to both Michigan and Tennessee. And here's another um, some more data on how we're how we're doing. So, 20 years ago, Michigan did not look that unlike Michigan today. Massachusetts. Massachusetts didn't look that, <laughs> that different from Michigan today. Um, it was a post-industrial state. It had gone through more than two decades of plant closings, right, textile closings, as those um, companies left for the South and for Asia. Um, there was a lot of frustration on both sides of the aisle. Um, there had been a lot of disinvestment. And um, in the business community and on um, the Republican side of the aisle, there was a, um, a, a, a frustration and a, and a big emphasis on more accountability, more transparency, and really pressing on the education community to improve outcomes for students. In the field, there was a tremendous amount of frustration because they felt like the state had not kept up with um, investments that it should have. 
um, they didn't feel like there was a lot of support. Um, and they didn't feel like a lot of the infrastructure and the systems in place were working very well to support um, big improvements in learning. So um, over the course of a few years, there were a number of civic organizations, organizations like ours, some in the business community, that essentially struck a grand bargain between those sides and said, um, if we invest significantly in systems improvement and in, in greater peer pupil spending, um, will you work with us to be more accountable? Will you work with us to really transform these systems, right? And really, and we're gonna hold you individually accountable too as educators for this, right? And so um, that bargain led to, um, really it was the beginning of what has been a 25 year trajectory to make them now one of the leading states, not only in the US, but arguably in, in the world. There was major investments in, in schools. Today, Massachusetts spends almost double what we spend in education, if you can imagine that. They put a, into place um, a weighted student funding formula that puts more money into schools um, with high levels of poverty. And there's also more money for special education students because it provides schools um, with more services and training that we know that kids who are far behind or need more support that they need, right? Especially if you're a child in Pontiac or Grand Rapids or Detroit and you're now four years behind and it's fourth grade. There's a lot that we need to do in kids' lives in those early grades to help them catch up. They were one of the first states in the country to begin to implement high standards. We're really just beginning to do that in Michigan, but they began doing that all the way back in the early 90s. Um, and they've continued to do that. They've made major investments around college and career readiness. I'm, gonna talk, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about all the details in this, um, and I, you have the slides and we won't run through all these bullets. Um, I really wanna leave time to, to allow you to ask questions and have a conversation. But we've also included in your packets um, a state strategy brief on Massachusetts and on Tennessee, and we're gonna be coming out with more about these states and what they've done over the last 20 years. Um, so we will be happy to, to ask more detailed questions about these states. Some of the things that they did um, was that they, they invested significantly in the development and retention of talent, um, talented educators using um, K-12 data systems, including things like value added to inform instruction and earlier diagnosis of problems and earlier interventions in kids' lives. They did um, put into place teacher performance standards and accountability for in, in, uh, individual educators. Um, they've um, put money into expanded learning time. They have literally trained all of their educators in the state on how to teach to the new Common Core state standards. I've talked a little bit about the waiting student funding formula they've put in, right? They've also, they've even invested in um, helping schools keep, in, keep up with um, changes in inflation and accounting for pension cost. And there was major investment in extended day programs for, especially for students who needed them, for students who need to catch up. They also made a grand bargain on charter schools that I think that, that Michigan can learn a lot from. So Massachusetts has um, very high performance standards for charter operators that want to open in the state or expand. They're very tight with, organize, um, with authorizing and they now have one of the highest performing charter sectors in the country. In fact, I was at a, a national conference last fall. I um, presented um, with a number of the state's leading charter operator leaders um, and it was a really inspirational story to hear Uncommon Schools um, and um, other um, leading operators there talk about how they were glad to have high standards, that they were glad to be part of such a high-performing charter sector. They're proud, they were proud of their performance and they're proud of their state, right? They feel um, blessed and lucky to be part of such a high-performing state and to be part of a really important part of the infrastructure there. So I want to talk a little bit about Tennessee and then really just have a conversation with you about, about these states and, and all of the other issues that, that uh, looks like are on your mind today. So, you know, as we've traveled around the state sharing findings from our new annual report, it's been really interesting. A lot of people said, oh yeah, Massachusetts. No surprise there. But Tennessee, wow, they're terrible, aren't they? Um, we said, you know, yeah, they, they haven't been. I mean, traditionally, they weren't a higher performing education state. And in fact, they were um, a lower performing than Michigan, including for African-American achievement as um, recent ago as about 10 years ago. 
um, but today they are now um, um, improving their students at the highest levels in some subjects in the country, and they're getting extraordinary growth for African American students as well. Um, so they've, they've um, helped their African American students come up across the board on average an entire additional year ahead in learning um, in eighth grade, for example, than they had been about a decade ago. This gives you a sense of how Michigan and Tennessee stack up over the last decade. Again, we started about, been about the same place. And if you can just look at the trajectory in recent years, we want to talk about what that um, has looked like. So there has been a lot of emphasis in Tennessee over the last four to five years about getting alignment across multiple sectors, across the business community, among conservatives and liberals, um, with, with advocacy and policy organizations like ours, um, with the traditional K-12 sector, getting an alignment about what, can, what do we agree on? What do we agree on and what are we going to do together? We're going to, we're going to do this together. We're make a commitment. We're going to be held accountable. Um, and we know we have to change and we're in this together. Um, there's been a lot of work to make sure that the, the work that they've done is actually based on real research and that they've actually implemented with fidelity and there's been a sustained commitment to investment even though there's been a change in governors and a change in parties in the legislature. So again, I'm not going to go through all the details of these slides, um, but you may know that, um, that Tennessee had one of the first K-12 value-added data systems in the country. Right now, for example, uh, or in recent years, if I'm a second, um, the, the parent of a second grader in Grand Rapids, I could actually request something called the student projection report, and that re report would be able to tell me how on track my student is to be college and career ready. Is, 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 even to get information about what would my child get if she stayed on this trajectory on the ACT in 11th grade. That's so helpful when your child is in first and second and third grade rather than in 10th grade, right? Especially if your child is four years behind in reading, right? Um, that data system has really been used to inform educators' instruction, and that data is available to teachers and principals. There's, there's very tight confidentiality on all of this, right? Um, so that it's not shared with reporters. Um, but, but it's really used to help drive instruction and in early um, interventions in students' lives. One of the most innovative um, things that they've done is that they've, they've identified their highest performing educators in the state. They've trained them to become the coaches of um, the Common Core State Standards. They now have more than 600 of these teacher leader coaches in the state, and those teachers are now supporting um, and building the capacity of the other teachers around the state and how to teach in Common Core. We haven't even begun, we haven't even begun to start even thinking about what our state strategy is on, on supporting and building capacity to teach to Common Core. And you should know that there's a number of organizations around the state, including ours, um, that have been advocating to the legislature, to the governor's office, that we need to invest in our teachers to help them make sure that they make this transition where we know that many teachers are going to be left behind and we know that their students are going to be left behind, right, as you know. So, um, again, I just want to talk a little, I'm not going to talk about all of our recommendations. You know, we're wonks. We like, we could talk about um, a roadmap for Michigan in great detail for three hours. Um, and we really know that we need to, we need to, to do this in just a couple minutes. So. One of, some of the really big opportunities that we have right now is um, to ensure that the governor's recommendation to invest in our first statewide educator evaluation and support system, that the legislature makes, um, comes in on that investment. We know that's very important to you and to the MDE, but we want to make sure that teachers get the data and support and the feedback that they, that they deserve. And that evaluation is not just about accountability, it really is about improvement. And um, Deborah Ball and the Governor's Council developed a roadmap to make sure that this new system is really about improvement and better feedback and coaching, that takes investment. So in the next three years, we need to make sure that we invest to make sure that happens. We have a big opportunity to make sure that this new data system that's being proposed in the budget is aligned with the pre-K data work that you guys at the MDE are working on, Mike, 
and to make sure that's all aligned with our larger longitudinal data system. I know in the philanthropic community, that is a really big in priority. The data systems are really key, and we think that that could be really powerful for both educators and um, in the nonprofit and, and civic leaders around the state. And I don't have to tell you how important Common Core is, um, but we have to make sure that we help people make this transition and that we implement with fidelity. Um, this has paid off so much in Maryland, in Minnesota, in Massachusetts, in Tennessee. Um, and these are two really tightly intertwined strategies, right? Um, so for us, um, when we talk about teaching quality, that's not to, um, that's not to underplay the, um, what we know makes an impact in students' lives outside of schools and in the classroom. At the same time, there's a lot that we can't control in the education system, right? And we know you guys aren't going to end poverty in Michigan this year. Maybe. Trying. Yeah. Trying. <laughs> but globalization is also working against us, right? And so, I mean, while there are efforts to um, deal with the inequality and poverty problems that we have in our state, and we need to do more on that side, we really do, we know that so many of the socioeconomic trends that are, that are hitting the, the country are hitting us especially hard because of our transition um, from an industrial economy to a knowledge-based economy. Um, and we know that it's going to take us many, many years to make arguably decades, right, to make that transition. And so one of the most important things that we can do is to ensure that all students have access to um, um, high-performing, high-achieving schools. And we can't control how excited all of our 10th graders are to come to school. And I was one of those 10th graders. I wasn't always excited to be at school. Um, but nevertheless, um, when I was engaged and I was in a classroom with great teachers um, and um, and I was pushed and I was challenged, um, it, it makes a huge difference. And we know that makes a huge difference. More than three decades of research tell us that. So we'd love to chat more about this. Let me, um, there's a teachable moment here that I think the board knows, but maybe some of our other folks looking in and sitting here today. Um, I was surprised a little bit that, I know the Grand Rapids example of seeing whether you're ready, college ready is accurate. When the board made the decision to do the cut scores, that's exactly what we did statewide. In other words, now because we redid the cut scores, if your kids are proficient with the new cut scores, it means they are on track to be college and career ready. That was the whole purpose behind that. So that is a system issue we could be proud of, you should be proud of, because these are tough things to hear and we need to do more of it. Um, and I would mention one other thing. I think Amber's support is almost singular. I mean, there's others out there that we've had to cajole uh, in terms of SBAC. Um, but one of the things to just think about is just the fact that the, the environment that kids will be in with SBAC testing will be more around constructed responses than it is currently will help us align to the NAEP in a better way than we have been. There's some advantages to states that kind of have similar NAEP-like tests. So I say those two things really just for kind of context, Thank you. Sure. overall we got a lot of work to do. But those are two things I would just call to attention right out of the block, that I think we're heading in the right direction if we do SBAC, and we're certainly um, on track in terms of people understanding with proficiency, real proficiency, whether their kids are going to be college and career ready. So, Dan, then Richard, then Kathleen. In fact, no, we're going to switch it. Kathleen, yeah, switch it then Richard, then Dan. <laughs> Are going to start with me? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amber. It's both uh, scary and it points out that we've done a lot of things wrong, I think. I think our strategy in the last 20 years of, of creating more school charter schools and having them run by for-profit management companies, 80% of them, which is way more than anybody else, any other state in the country from what I've seen, and with no uh, standards mm -hmm. for creating that, that they have to meet certain standards mm -hmm. and have show some ability to run a good school, as opposed to Massachusetts, uh, no controls, mm -hmm. has proved to be very, has, has not proved to be as effective as the people who supported it thought it would be. And it, it's 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 destroying the public school system in Detroit. I mean, it, it's something. I mean, it's just 
the public school system has dropped down from when I was running millage campaigns 40 years ago or something. We had a, almost 200,000 students. Mm -hmm. Now we're down to less than 50,000. I mean, it's just incredible. And uh, as you pointed out, the charter schools have more students in Detroit than, than DPS. And the studies show that the results aren't any better on the whole. A few schools are really good, but there are schools in the Detroit public school system that are really good too still. So it's, 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 it's very distressing that we weren't, we, I think we've gone down the wrong path. So how do we, we had to change this, this culture. I think your study really helps a lot to maybe point that out to several members of the legislature and the governor. I don't know, have you got any reaction to what you were saying That's here from the governor's <laughs> office or from Smile. some of the key legislators? So you should and know that is we're, <laughs> mm -hmm, we're governance neutral. And so we're in support of high performing schools, um, no matter who runs them, right? If it's a for-profit or non-profit entity, if it's a traditional public school, if it's a, if it's a charter school. Um, and we know that, that um, our, our, you know, now at a, what a, about a billion dollars a year investment in charter schools in Michigan is paying off in, for some students and that there are some high performing charter schools. We've profiled them in the last few years, including in the city of Detroit. And this, for the students in those schools, they're better off. They are certainly far better off. The problem, as you're highlighting, is that there's not enough of those and there are too many of the low performers, right? And simply replicating failure has not been effective. And the data um, do show, right, over the last 20 years that simply just saying uh, we'll let, let, we'll just let everything kind of go wild and we'll hopefully it'll work out in the long run. <laughs> You know, as my father-in-law likes to say, in the long run, we'll all be dead, right? So, um, you know, um, in the long run, um, we'll have two more generations of students dropped out, and for many of them, we'll be living in poverty and illiterate, right, on top of it, based on this data, right? This data shows that there are tens of thousands of students on track to be illiterate in Michigan right this moment. So, um, so I, I, I think, um, you know, there have been a number of organizations around the state, including in the business community and including in the civic sector like ours, that have been um, calling for the need for performance standards for either the opening of, um, of new operators and the continued expansion. You know, we would say that if you're an operator and you've had a dismal track record of performance, right, and in some cases for seven and ten and even more years, shouldn't you be focused on improving your existing schools before you open more? Because yes, ultimately it's about quality, it's not about quantity. <laughs> right, it's really not about quantity, right? So it's, it's best for our students if we focus on improving what we've got going on now rather than, um, than rapid growth. It's not about market share, it's about getting kids up to college and career ready standards, right, no matter where they live, so. Thank you. Richard? We have a long discussion, Dan, but John. people want to say okay. something. Um, <clears throat> I have two questions, so I guess I'll have to get in the queue after this one here. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm always disappointed when I see comparisons between Michigan and other states that fail to take into account, um, for example, on page seven, you, when you've got the NAEP performance and kids are, are compared or our students' performances is ranked, um, you know, by 2011-2013, um, Michigan students are on average a quarter of a year younger than the students in the other states because we are among the last, if not the last, to raise kindergarten entrance from December 1st to uh, September 1st and we still haven't finished completing that. So when you, when your students are on average 5% younger uh, that's going to be reflected in, in how much they are prepared to learn, how much they can learn. Now, it's not, it's not the whole explanation for the difference between Michigan and other states, but I think it is a significant factor that has been neglected in many of these comparative studies. Mm. Um, strangely enough, it doesn't get a whole lot of press, and uh, candidly, I think when we adopted last year the, uh, the changing the... Uh, 
uh, changing the uh, entrance uh, dates, I, I think that's in the long run, of course we'll all be dead by the time we see results, uh, is probably one of the most significant steps that this board has made to help uh, early education and, 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 and Michigan uh, performance. Um, Can we respond to that? Certainly. <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, I think it's a good point. I, okay. I, to be honest, we haven't looked at that. What I would say is, even if you don't look at the ranks and you only look at the average scores, our average scores over the past decade have remained pretty stagnant, right? We haven't, we haven't gained ground, and, and as we showed in fourth grade reading, we've, our average scores actually decreased in fourth grade reading. So even if you disregard what every other state is doing, Michigan is not making progress. And and there are other other uh, well, for example, uh, your your data on how African American students were doing uh, and uh, their record of achievement in Grand Rapids, which is a district that, from all I've heard, is doing everything right, and yet their uh, achievement growth uh, in in the one ranking was less than that of Detroit. Mm -hmm. So. And I, I guess it is uh, a, maybe a painful reminder that policies that may be good for one segment of, of the population might not necessarily be optimal for another segment. And well, the data don't show that yet. I mean, okay. we, Grand Rapids Public Schools is one of our ongoing partners, and, um, you know, they've only started. <laughs> I mean, okay. I, you okay. know, I mean, so we, um, it, you know, what we've had people say, oh, we've, yeah, we're do we've done Common Core, it's not worked. We haven't even started Common Core. We're about to start doing it this coming school year, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk to the leaders in Massachusetts about their early years, which are always the hardest, yeah. um, they said, you know, those first three years were really tough because there were so many critics on both the left and the right that said it's not working, it's not working. And it was that strong state leadership in both the State Department of Education and the governor's office and in the business and, and policy and advocacy community and, and a lot of the K-12 community, right, um, said, no, we're going to keep doing this, right? It's a little like when you go on a diet or a fitness regime and, you know, it's not fun going to work out if you haven't worked out for a while. Yeah. And you may not see weight loss, but you keep going, you keep going, right? And over time, or when you're on a new diet to lower your cholesterol, right, or over time, right, we know what the research tells us actually works. So, um, and they had to stay the course. And they started getting a bump in years four and five, and then they just took off, and they, and they never looked back. Tennessee, it's taken about two to three years. Um, implementing with fidelity, consistent um, implementation, major investment in implementation. Now, um, Grand Rapids has just really begun to implement um, capacity building strategies, a talent strategy. They're just beginning to put into place their um, educator evaluation system. They're just, you know, they've, they've been now, to their credit, they're far out ahead of a lot of other school districts um, in that they've been training I and mean, getting ready for Common Core for the last two years. but they're not going to know how that's paying off for at least two to three years because we're not even going to have data, any reliable data for two to three years, right? So, um, so you know, there's a lot that we're doing right. We're, we're on track. But um, as you know, um, there's lots of pressures to not stay on track, you know? Um, it's True. hard. Change is hard, especially in the beginning. And we are asking people to make big changes. Common Core is asking the field to totally overhaul how you teach in the classroom. That's hard to do, especially when you're strapped. It's not, it's not like the school can shut down, right, for three months in the fall and say, we're just going to practice and get ready. Right? We can't do that, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard work. So, um, so they need support and they need help in the transition. Dan, John, Richard, Mike. Um, uh, first, just thank you guys. Um, I really... I, I just want to acknowledge you for the contribution you make around data in our state. Um, I, I've heard many folks say that you guys have the, the, the best data around, um, and frankly that kind of information and the way that you regularly provide it to all of us helps make us all smarter. Um, uh, it's just a tremendous value. It's been a tremendous value for me at Excellence Schools Detroit and here at this table and for many, many others as well. So just thank you for that overall. 
Uh, second, I'm curious about your perspective on the intersection between kind of weighted funding formulas mm -hmm. and um, and accountability, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, so when those two subjects come up, or, or let's let's call it weighted funding formulas and performance-based funding, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So when those two issues come up, frequently what we hear is um, uh, from weighted funding formula fans, mm -hmm. where that was a mouthful, mm -hmm. uh, something along the lines of if uh, a school has a higher percentage of low-income students or students with special needs or English language learners mm -hmm. or what have you, like mm -hmm. any one of a number of uh, different criteria, mm -hmm. that school should get more money because it's a, it's harder work, it's mm -hmm. a heavier lift, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this kind of performance-based funding mm -hmm. uh, uh, argument, which is, hey, if you are serving similarly situated students and you're doing better, like you sh we should reward performance with money as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, kind of rewarding mediocrity with mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is the argument that those folks would make. Mm -hmm. Where do you guys land in that space and, mm -hmm. and why? So I feel like we have to tread carefully on this topic because um, we, we personally are not school finance experts. We have a, a vice president of that in Washington, D.C., and he could tell you more about weighted student funding formulas and the funding formulas around the country and how they intersect with accountability than I can even you know Im imagine. So. Um, um, so when you but when you talk about accountability and performance pay, do you mean an individual educators or do you mean schools? I mean schools. Schools. Sense, okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to start on that or not? Sure. I mean, so so what we've learned, for instance, from Massachusetts is that they have something similar to what you're talking about with weighted weighted funding, and they have all these categories of student demographics, but they also take into account costs. And you know, something Audrey brought up was the difference in cost in in running a school in Boston as opposed to who knows where, you know, uh, outstate, right, yeah. outstate Massachusetts. And, and Massachusetts takes that into account when funding schools. So if it's more expensive to buy things in Boston, then, then schools get more money to do that. So I think we would say there's, there's a certain level of funding that schools need to run adequately, right? And then they need, a, you know, potentially additional funding on top of that, depending on their student needs. I think the research suggests that targeted funding and investment in the sorts of strategies that we're talking about here is the way to kind of get a bang for your buck above that kind of adequate floor. The things that actually work, rather than simply more money into pensions and healthcare, and that's not to say that our educators need pensions and healthcare, right? And we're not. I'm not. We're not arguing that. But um, I mean, another thing to keep in mind is that um, you know these are also states that have very rigorous accountability systems in place, both for edu individual educators and statewide for schools. And so um, there are efforts in a lot of those kinds of states that when a school is chronically failing, it's given been given adequate time to turn around. Um, maybe there's been a five-year plan in place. Um, there may have been philanthropic investment. At some point, there's a there's a, a conversation about okay, we need to have a conversation about shutting you down, right? And that's true for charter schools as well. The bar for charter schools in a place like Massachusetts is actually higher because the promise of charter schools was that we are here to provide a better choice than the traditional public school in your region. So they actually have less time, right, to to show um, high performance. So, um, you know, as you know, that our, that's not a part of our accountability, and that's not to take away the work that the MDE has done on accountability in the last few years. I mean, you've really put into place, Mike, the state's first real school accountability system, right? And it's very thoughtful, um, and there's a lot to like about it. Um, but, you know, I think the question around closing and also around supports for low-performing schools is a, is a big one, and it's worth you know, probably more time than we have today. But um, yeah. there are lots of states that do that far better than we do. Um, and Massachusetts is definitely one of those states. Yeah. I think one, one more point I wanted to make regarding kind of the, um, not the weighted fun funding program, but the sort of accountability-based ba funding. I mean, certainly that the kind of adequate floor of funding should not be affected by performance, right? I mean, if you're a low-performing school, 
and you're then getting even less funding, less than what you really need to run a school properly, that doesn't really make sense. It's not good for kids, right? I mean, if students are still going to be enrolled in that school. So I think thinking about accountability and how to, you know, close schools down eventually makes sense, right? John, otherwise Richard. Otherwise the kids suffer, right? right? I mean, John, Richard, I Mike. Get to talk a little more about the nature of the strategic investments that we are perhaps not making, but in the context of A, like others, you know, really, Amber and Sarah and your team appreciating the candor and the clarity of reporting on our performance, and it is not where it needs to be, and we need to appreciate that and use that to drive actions that get us where I need to be, and the clarity of what other states are doing that we're not doing that we need to do to do better. Um, and you're also, as you articulated, very eager to, uh, and these other states have had some broad, at least middle, of business, civic, political leadership, bipartisan, being willing to move the agenda forward. Mm -hmm. um, we are challenged, I would say, at this moment of needing to stretch that agreement further. I think, as your work reflects, we have seen it in recent years around early childhood, though it's you know, rearranging investment, not new investment. We've seen it around the Common Core, support for that, where some Republican governor, business leaders, we have been supported. We've seen it around um, the teacher assessment evaluation, the need to do that well per the Dev Ball report. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how where we need to stretch our um, agreement of what's important to do. It was noted here stretching it to include, which it hasn't to date, some quality expectations and performance expectations on charters and choice mm -hmm. seems to make sense mm -hmm. logically, but we have not seen support for that right. from the advocates of, of choice and charters, right. which you'd think pro-charter choice advocates would be supportive of quality, mm -hmm. not anything goes education. Mm -hmm. But we also have not seen, I was really struck by Paul Ravel's comments from Massachusetts, who you know, is, a, is a thoughtful guy. Um, We've demanded more in terms of standards and lots of reforms without what he says. It's, it's nuts to say, do this without building capacity, without supporting investment, without doing the right. other things to help people to do it. Right. Can you talk about more specific examples of the help and the investments that they made or others have made that we are not making as we demand better teachers, higher yeah. standards, yeah. so that we can see practically what are the things we need to do to invest, to support the reforms that we have not been willing to do today. Yeah, yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think there's some takeaways that we can um, we can think about from um, based on both Massachusetts and Tennessee's experience. So Massachusetts clearly their funding formula um, gets at equity issues, right? We don't do that. We don't equity, do that. Define equity though because there's like so equity in five terms definitions of, out there. of need, right? In terms of um, um, of the need of, of schools and of particularly of kids. So we know, for example, that African American and Latino students come in as early as kindergarten and first grade, far behind their affluent white peers. We know over the next 12 years that that gap for Latino students will not change. It does not change. And for African American students, it actually grows. And so in order to close the gap, we actually have to invest more in making sure that we're providing those kids the supports they need to, to close the gap. We do the opposite in, in many states and in our state, right, is that we say, we're going to give you kids of color and low-income students, we're going to give you even less. We're going to invest less in your schools. We're going to give you often less support, right? Um, we're going to give you, you might have, um, you might have fewer uh, tutoring. You might not have an extended day. You, and we know the, the research has overwhelmingly found that higher um, poverty schools are, have disproportionate numbers of ineffective teachers. Right? And the blacker or browner the school, the more ineffective teachers there are. So we give kids even less. What, what, what Massachusetts funding formula tries to get at is the needs around special education needs and around um, for, for low-income students, right? That they need more support because they're already behind. In Tennessee, I think there's some really, there's, um, you know, the funding levels there per, per pupil are much more similar to Michigan's. The teacher salaries are much more similar to Michigan's, and yet they're soaring past us in terms of student growth. So what have they done in terms of investment? So they have had a much more of a targeted investment approach. 
Um, in the last several years, they've, as we've said, they've put enormous amounts of investment and time into building capacity of school leaders and, and um, teachers to teach to the Common Core. Right. They've also put into this new educator evaluation system, and that is all around improvement and training people across the state. How do you be a better support to your teacher? I mean, I was a teacher, Sarah was a teacher. I think it's okay if I say this, I, we've talked about this a lot. As any of you know, the first few years in teaching are really hard. You really don't know what you're doing. And in my case, I mean, the first like six months, I think I got like uh, 20 minutes of feedback. It would have been enormously helpful, not only for me, but for my students, if I was getting regular feedback, regular coaching, regular mentoring, right? That's very common for early career teachers, and we know that in the first five years of, uh, for most teachers, those are some of their least effective years in the classroom, right? So, um, and the students pay the price. So in this kind of system, right, in a tenure, in a performance-based tenure system, there's more that we need to do that to ensure that's not only fair for teachers, but it's fair for students that we're raising the level of the quality of teaching in all of our classrooms. So Tennessee did that through state level strategies, right? I mean, they're provide, they identified through their new data, their growth data, who are these high performing teachers in the state who should be identified to be the coaches of other teachers in their state, right? And that's really, frankly, valuing and honoring the importance of teaching and what a complex, important profession it is. And so the state did that. Uh, one more thing to, note, to um, make note of, the state also overhauled its regional centers. So their equivalent of their ISDs, they completely overhauled them over the, over the course of a few years. They even changed the names to make, to make it clear to the field, this is not about micromanaging you, it's not about compliance, and it's not about coming to visit you, and you know what a lot of educators tell us is, not, and not all ISDs, but, but some of them, right? They'll, they'll send their folks in and, and educators will tell us like, that was a waste of my, that was a, just a total waste of my time. It wasn't helpful. So they completely overhauled their regional centers to make them about service and to make them helpful to educators on the ground. And they have played a really important role in implementation of both Common Core and their new, new educator evaluation system. Richard, then Mike, thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, somewhat partial to the Foundation for Excellence in Education. Mm -hmm. how, would, uh, how would the uh, goals or assumptions of um, uh, Education Trust Midwest compare with, uh, with the Foundation for Excellence in Education, which has tried to push the uh, reforms that have worked in Florida so well mm -hmm. nationally? Patricia, Patricia Lavasquez, is that who you're? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So both our national office and our office here ha have done work with them. Um, I really like Patricia. I think she's top notch and, and her team is really smart and we have collaborated with them. Um, and Florida has done a lot of great work on um, raising achievement across the board and around closing gaps. They have seen really amazing growth for African American and Latino students in their state. And they've done a lot of targeted investment strategies, lots of work around around data um, systems, lots of work around educator um, capacity building. So for example, before they even thought about a third grade retention strategy, they spent, what, three or four years? I think it was more <laughs> than that. More simultaneous. Yeah, and it spent more than $100 million in re literally retraining every single one of their K-12 teachers and how to be better teachers of literacy. I think, I think they're four point uh, advocacy has been uh, uh, strong preschool programs, educational choice, um, professional development, and oh, what's the other one? <laughs> I forget the fourth one. Uh, but do those differ from education trusts uh, formula for for addressing, or is there a different emphasis? That's what, kind of what I'm. Yeah, I mean, I I have never sat down with Patricia for like five hours and went detail by detail of all the nuts and bolts of their stances, but um, but I can tell you that I did sit in a really candid and interesting conversation, a presentation by um, go former Governor Bush, as you know, that's his foundation, um, and um, and I I found him to be um, very intelligent, very thoughtful, and I we, I didn't feel like we were that far off from them. Um, you know, one of the things that he did say was that, you know, he said when we first really started opening up our markets to, to choice and charter schools, um, we just sort of didn't 
did the whole unregulated thing, and then he said we quote we matured, sure. and, and we realized that that was not the way to go, and that we needed to put um, some more um, to more standards in, and to think more about performance, right? Because it's just not fair to kids, um, and so um, so I, I thought I found him to be a very thoughtful leader. <coughs> Thank you, Michelle. Then Mike. Oh, I didn't realize it was my turn. <clears throat> Um, I really appreciate your work on this, and um, uh, it, it was, I think it's very important. I think your perspective on charter schools and having a um, more accountability is right on the mark. So um, <clears throat> my questions were more um, to some of the recommendations and, um, uh, and, and some statements that were made. And, I, and the question that I have is, um, you know, you made the, the comment that income, if I understand right, income does not have an effect or poverty does not have an effect on achievement? No. Glad that you didn't say that. Um, it's okay. All right, all right. My concern is um, you're, well, first of all, you, you made the statement that there are many ineffective teachers, the browner or the Based, and I'm just wondering, based on brown or black, or uh, a school district is there's worse teachers. A school, yeah, not yeah. a district, a school. A yeah. school, a school. Mm -hmm. Okay, <coughs> so that's based on what criteria we use to determine effectiveness. There have been many studies over the years, and we could send you, we could send you citations and data slides and all kinds of other things. Okay, if yeah. So, so yeah. the research suggests. So, if you look at qualifications, for instance, so whether a teacher is credentialed to teach in that subject, there are fewer teachers in, in their subject area in, my, in high minority, high poverty schools. There are teachers okay. with, with less experience. And now with new data on effectiveness, there are fewer teachers with sort of high effectiveness, um, usually calculated based on their students' growth on right. test scores. So if the, if the standardized test is linked, the, the, how well a student does on a standardized test is co closely linked with their income status. Right. So then the teacher gets punished for working in a high poverty area, whereas that same teacher, if they went to Ghost Point or West Bloomfield, where the students come to the school generally with you know more resources at so home, then they will be those teachers will get a, an advantage. So um, I'm, my concern is, because uh, I, I live in Detroit, my kids go, I have four kids in Detroit public schools right now, mm -hmm. in Cook Elementary, where two of my kids go. Mm -hmm. uh, the principal has been in five different schools, six different schools in the last six years. Mm -hmm. Teachers are fired at the end of every year, mm -hmm. and then hired back based on some, I don't know what, whether the administrators like them or not. Mm -hmm. And it, that, kind of formula, this, my concern is a reform that focuses so much on um, just closing schools, um, moving around teachers that are rated as ineffective due to standardized test scores or administrator bias. How do you, I mean, I think it has a direct impact on the quality of the education. Sure. That the kids get, sure. and, and the commitment in the community. Yeah. And closing a school destroys a community. I've seen that. My husband's lived out in Morindale, in the west side of Detroit, mm -hmm. and they closed Kosciuszko, and I mean that it wiped out the whole neighborhood, and the mm -hmm. property value sunk. It's a mess out there. So Mike's doing so me the, the, the that's pen, my right? my concern <laughs> is how do you when we're making these policies where we just say close schools or you know, just these teachers are ineffective and we should rate them, you know, based on these standardized test scores. First of all, I question the validity of these standardized test scores as a measure of teacher's effectiveness given the other variables. And then to punish the school and the community based on them. Mm -hmm. I guess, how do you justify, given the lack of validity of these standardized test scores as being an accurate measure, how do you justify the, the policies that um, follow, either firing those teachers or closing the schools based on So that. there's some background that you should know that I have to take okay. 10 seconds to tell okay. you. So we haven't been, we haven't advocated for closing schools. Okay. What Dan was asking was, how do you, like, how do you navigate that, right? Because some people would say, you know, if they're not doing well, stop giving them money. 
height. I mean, if, you know, if it's like saying, my child's acting up, and so I'm not going to feed her. I mean, you know, I mean right, right. <laughs> it's not very helpful. Um, so, um, so we don't. That's not what. That's not our stance. He, he was just. I was just giving him context from other states. Okay. The other thing to know is that um, I would say that there's been no other organization in the state, and certainly in Lansing, that has has fought harder to make sure that evaluation is not only done in a thoughtful way, but it's done in a fair way, mm -hmm. to both teachers and students, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that it's constructive. Um, and that we're finding the right balance between accountability and support. And I think that's what um, Deborah Ball was after. And you should know we worked with, with Deborah and the council for more than two years in support of that work. So, um, but the issue around the growth, and you raised the issue around um, how do you get at poverty, right? So right now in Michigan, we have, we have fairly, you know, not very reliable state data. And one of the reasons is because we don't, we can't get good growth data out of the meat. So we have been one of a number of organizations, including many of the urban um, school superintendents in the state and the Mackinac Center. Um, so both, you know, groups across the spectrum that have been advocating and trying to voice support for um, a fair and thoughtful new um, student growth data system that would really get at what you're talking about. So, so for example, in a place like Tennessee, um, we know that, as we said, kids come in far, far beyond. Some kids are, are far, you know, if you've never seen a book and you're in kindergarten, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Of course you're gonna be behind. Of right. course you are, right? Does it, does it mean that you don't have the potential to go to Harvard? It just means that there's more work that needs to be done to help you catch up, right? Um, and so in, in sophisticated data systems that we hope to put into place here is that we can actually get at how far, far behind kids are when they come in to schools and how much teachers um, are getting, growth they're getting. And, this, and there are systems that can do that because what you're saying is if we, didn't, if we didn't consider for that, right, it would be unbelievably unfair to teachers. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of factors that outside of the classroom that impact yeah, we know. the growth over a year. So Absolutely. And that teachers yeah. are being held solely responsible and their jobs yeah. are dependent on it. So would you and new, and new assessments you will allow us to do that. There's actually a piece in, right. in your packet about this topic if so, you want more information okay. about that. Would you support suspending then this evaluation um, based on uh, 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 standardized test scores, especially with the Common Core transition, until those there's more stability and it's more reliable because you had mentioned that it's not really reliable right now with the, inf the, the initial implementation. Not. Yeah, right. Well, with the initial implementation of Common Core in some of these states that have had it. Right. So, would you recommend suspending using the uh, that as a matrix for evaluating a school or so a So, we think teacher? it's important for you know for people to be held accountable for their performance regardless of of the, of the data piece, right? And that right. can be done through observation and other kinds of measures that, right. that schools have been doing for decades. But you're right in that what the research shows is that um, best practice would, would say that we need about three years of data before we begin to integrate the use of the new assessment data into educator evaluations. So we have supported a three-year moratorium on the use of new Common Core data in anybody's individual um, evaluations, and we're in alignment with the MEA and many, you know, I mean, a lot of what the national research says. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Half hour ago, I reserved this spot for Mike, and I'm going to yes. take it yes. because I don't often, with Sorry. the way we get I was rushed. Wondering. Huh? I said was. Richard, Kathy, <laughs> right. Michelle, Mike. Right, and I kept moving Mike back. Mike. I'm trying to be respectful. <laughs> but I, you know what? On a serious note, I feel like I don't represent our team very well. We spent a lot of time on this report last week, a lot of time, as a soups group that is hired by these folks here to do things like that. And, and overwhelmingly, by the way, we think it was well done, thoughtfully done, wake-up call, sobering, all those things. What I'm trying to do better, especially after meeting with soups this week and teachers who were very concerned about that report and felt somewhat defensive, is trying to balance, too, publicly. So here's part of that. I think what we did at our own team is realize, kind of that I snuck in a little while ago, that the board team here, the board and the team, did the right thing with the cut scores, got us going in that direction. Your acknowledgment of SBAC and our work on that and Joseph's leadership that situates us beautifully. Accountability system that you mentioned is better for the first time. 
Common Core, the fight here, unfortunately delayed for almost a year because of some of the politics that the board was way ahead on three years ago. Um, so there's some of that, but I, what I'm getting at is we, we feel like we're, tr we're troubled to not be defensive on behalf of the teachers in the state. But I have to admit, when I'm driving back from that forum I had with teachers, and my daughter's a teacher, it, you're always good enough and appropriate to talk about it's a system issue, and these are largely system issues. I would say part of the system issue is we were in a depression. We turned, not just personally, mm -hmm. we, uh, <laughs> we turned into a situation where we're trying to gather data on this, but what percentage of our seasoned teachers left in the last 10 years because of these undue retirement incentives yes. that paid off True. big True. And, then, and then admittedly, to your point, left all these one, two, three year teachers who appropriately take time to to be able to get their trade and their and their uh, craft down really that part of it 50 percent turnover in superintendents in the last three years i can tell you from personal experience that's not helpful mm -hmm. so i mean some of this is we we need to do something different than you you're doing exactly what you need to do what we need to do is try to get balance between the sobering reality mm -hmm. but some of the rewards some of the things we together as a state have been doing well Okay, but here's one that I can't reconcile and would like your advice on. When we met on this last week, when you gave us the preview, how is it that the NAEP is so negative about fourth grade reading and our own scores show us going up consistently the last couple of years? What, what's, the, what's the deal there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll speak to that. Well, so we admired the board's decision to, to change the cut scores several years ago. But even when we looked at sort of the comparison side by side between what the new cut score MEEP was saying and what NAEP was saying, there was a bigger difference in reading than there was in math, right? So the, the math NAEP back in 2011 matched really closely what the MEEP was saying um, about math in fourth and eighth grade with the new cut scores. But the reading was, was off by by about 30 percentage points, I think. So I, I think what that tells us, and you know, we haven't done a study of what the differences are between MEEP and NAEP, but what that tells us is that as we're moving to Common Core, and Smarter Balanced and Park will tell you that NAEP is right now our best indicator of what student performance might look like on these new assessments. Um, that Michigan might have some, some, some work to do, and we may see some declines in, in our state reading <laughs> assessment that may look more dramatic than in math. If I could yield my time to Senator Martineau for just a second. I, <laughs> what I'm getting is, I mean, this one's really important to us because it's probably the single measure that we try to focus on the most in the department, and we've kind of pushed it in the state, is the fourth grade reading. So maybe to more to try to genuinely understand this because if we're on the wrong track with that we need to be clear but it's kind of a shock to us when we think we're headed the right way when you look at please right so the the difference between the way standards were set on NAEP and the way standards were set on me and in the me was that um, in NAEP the standard setting panel used a definition that says this is what a proficient student can do on this test. Um, it was a, a, a narrative definition of what a, 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 a proficient student is supposed to do. Um, we, so, and they go through a subjective standard setting process. What we did when we reset standards on the MEEP and MME is we tied that to success in college. You did so what? We Sorry. tied that to success in, in the first credit bearing college oh, course. Okay. Um, so we had an external criterion that we used for setting the standard on, on the meet. Um, we, based on that analysis, because students who scored at a particular level on MME were able to succeed in very reading heavy courses in college, we felt like that was an appropriate cut score. Um, so they, there are competing paradigms for setting the standards on MEEP and NAEP. One is, are they able to succeed in college, which is what we use for me, and there's the narrative description that is then judged by panelists subjectively, 
would a student be able to do this if they scored this level on the name? Um, we tend to feel that the approach that was looking at the external criterion was more helpful, and in fact, it, 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 it's interesting. We happened to come out very close to NAEP cut scores on math. We came out, actually, with more rigorous cut scores in science because apparently um, professors of first credit-bearing courses in science expect a lot more of their students. Um, and we came out lower in reading. So um, we wouldn't expect it to be exactly the same. And, and in fact, I think that the idea is if you have a higher cut score on, on NAEP than you do on, on, on MEET, you can see growth uh, on the state assessment but not see that on the meet because of the, you may not just be moving students all the way up to that high, but you're getting much more, many more students above the, the lower cut score that we have that essentially predicts success in the, that, that first credit bearing college course. And also might keep in mind that part of what we're seeing is that there are just so many other states that are seeing their growth is so much more dramatic. Yeah. You know, that if we're running a race, we might be progressing some, it's just that these other folks are just yeah, sky riding, I fully, sky behind, fully get that, that sobering so, yeah. completely. It's yeah, just yeah. that I think if we're not at least thoughtful about how we at least, you have a different role, are giving credit sure. to teachers for getting growth towards that mm -hmm. on reading, <laughs> then we have another problem where the teachers, before you know it, are demoralized. How do we have 110,000 teachers that are demoralized, actually? Mm -hmm. So I think our role is a little bit different than that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the, the service that you provide is fantastic because we have to have these wake-up calls but I'm mm -hmm. kind of making a using this opportunity to to do what we did at Soup's group I knew what I was asking and I knew what Joseph was going to say that both and can be accurate and sure. true yeah absolutely Dan please um, and maybe just to put a bow on that uh, um, that really I think I just the the kind of competing assessments, both of which may be accurate uh, and uh, kind of different results explainable based on different different uh, scoring paradigms or rubrics or ultimate measures speaks to the relative value of moving to smarter balanced, yeah. um, which everybody uh, agrees on, well, which the department and Ed Trust and many other folks uh, agree on, myself included, um, as it gets us out of the business of trying to compare incompatible assessments and into the business, difficult to compare assessments, uh, and into the business of um, using consistent data to try and improve uh, outcomes for our kids. So I just, you know. And just as another aside, if I may get it in on the, 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 the teacher core issue, it's one of our problems we're struggling with because on the one hand, as you know, we changed the cut scores for entry into the profession. It dramatically reduced the number that could get in good news in one sense, bad news in another. We have a supply and demand issue, so there's those things to be considered at the same time, but very compl complex issues, to say the least. I want to um, just reinforce, Mike, the importance of what you're saying about the field, especially in the next few years, because this transition is going to be difficult, and it, it could be easy for people to get frustrated, right, or worry that I'm exercising, I'm not yeah. losing weight, I'm, I'm working, exactly. I'm working really hard at this, I'm not you know, we're doing worse, you know, than we were before. Um, but that's all normal. We yeah. should anticipate that, right? But we have to stay on track yeah. and, and just sort of suspend disbelief that right. um, that we can do this, right? And so as we, and, and that's going to be really important, and, and your leadership will be really important in the next few years on that. Muscle Point. weighs more than fat. John, what was your suggestion? So, um, well, first, thank you very, very much uh, thank you. for being here. And um, I think we're going to, I'm, I'm recommending, hello? Okay. Um, I, our attorneys are here, so what I would recommend, you know how much they charge. Um, <laughs> that we have to, that we could go, we break for our lunch meeting with them now. Back at perhaps one o'clock. We need a to, resolution to pick up. So, but we need a formal resolution that folks have to vote on for us to go into this session. So, let me let me read this. I move that we this board of education meeting closed session under Section 8A to the Open Meetings Act to consider material exempt from discussion or disclosure by state or federal statute under Section 13.1G of the FOIA FOIA specifically information or records subject to the attorney-client privilege. We need a roll call vote. So. I, I made Thank you for that. Second. <laughs> it was moved by John, supported by Richard. Austin? Yes. Fecto? Aye. 
Ramos Montini? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albrich? Yes. Varner? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Siley? Yes. Great. The motion passes. And we'll, uh, first of all, thank you, Amber. Thank As John you. said, this is really good. Your report's yeah. very well done, and uh, it's really going to help shape the, uh, the the changes we need to make here in Michigan. So thank, thank you. you. Clever. Like we did Sarah, the other. Are we staying in here? We're going, we're going to switch rooms. We'll be outside to show you where that is. The lunch will be in the room, so you don't need to go get your lunch. It's, it's in there. Okay. You're going to go out here and turn left. We'll be back at... at one. Marilyn, do I just call back in in about five minutes? Yeah, I'm going to end your connection and then I'll dial in. Yeah, we don't need more money.